Lauren Weymouth speaking to you from Ripple headquarters. Welcome back to Uber Connect 2020. If you joined us late last night, I hope you have a fresh cup of coffee. I haven't had mine yet, so thanks for bearing with me as I tell you all about the fantastic lineup of content coming your way. So we'll begin the show with three former US Treasury members discussing CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, Michael Barr, Adrian Harris, and Lev Menand. Then Zoe Cruz will lead a discussion featuring Rena Argawal, Jim Angel, and Sylvia Bartolucci on digital asset adoption. Just like Galaxy Digital hired a Goldman Sachs partner and Jack Dorsey just bought 50 million in Bitcoin, these finance experts will really bridge the gap between Wall Street and crypto. The rest of the show will focus on industry updates by RippleX, formerly known as Spring, the developer-focused arm of Ripple, building open source tools, including the recently released PayID protocol. Ripple CTO David Schwartz will be giving a keynote on the internet of value and payments. David is one of the original architects of the XRP ledger. And we'll hear from the CEO of BitPay, Stephen Pear, who will share some larger trends in the crypto space. He'll be followed by Joey Krug of Pantera Capital, who will discuss one of the most popular trends in crypto, DeFi, and how it relates to payments. We then have a ton of really interesting demos from you by BitPay, Crypto.com, BitTrue, Tangem, PayBurner, PayMe Plus, as well as some technical demos by the Ripple team on using the PayID protocol. These will move really fast. They're five to 10 minute segments. Developers are going to want to stay through the end because Jen Yu, VP of Growth and Operations at RippleX, will close with an exciting new grant program. Remember, you can use the chat throughout the day to ask questions to our presenters. We're awarding prizes courtesy of the block research for the most engaged schools as measured by Q&A, sessions attended, and networking. Let's get started. Over to you, Michael, Adrian, and Lev. Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's really great to have you all here joining us. Uh, my name is Michael Barr. I'm the dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. I'm here with Adrian Harris, professor of practice at the University of Michigan's Ford School, and Lev Menard, who is a lecturer and fellow at Columbia Law School. All three of us are former U.S. Treasury Department officials, and we're delighted to be with you here today to talk about central bank digital currency. We're gonna have really an informal conversation and I hope you enjoy it. We uh, should have a moment or two for questions at the very end. And uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm gonna to kick it off, um, uh, Lev, perhaps with a, a question for you to get us started and then uh, all three of us could join in. There are lots of different ways of approaching the development of a central bank digital currency. Two big categories are account-based approaches and token-based approaches. I'm wondering if you could just uh, get us started by helping us understand the key differences. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Michael. So perhaps the best place to start is with account-based CBDCs because they are probably the most familiar to everyone. An account-based CBDC would be just like a bank account, except at the central bank. And account-based CBDCs, they actually already exist, but they're generally available only to an exclusive clientele, namely banks and various government entities. So for example, in the United States, most banks have accounts at the Federal Reserve. The US Treasury has an account there. And the balances in these accounts are digital ledger entries. They're called reserves. And they're structured just like the deposits you or I might have in our own banks, like if we have a bank account at, say, Citigroup. Um, so reserve accounts are extremely attractive. They are non-defaultable sovereign money. There's no deposit insurance limit. They pay a high interest rate. Uh, in the U.S., this is known as uh, the interest on reserves rate. Payments between these accounts clear instantly. They offer fraud protection and customer service. So if something goes wrong with your account, there's a person you can call at the Federal Reserve, just like you could call someone at Citigroup if something goes wrong with your account there. Um, and now for the Fed to offer these accounts to millions of people, instead of just thousands of banks, it would obviously need to build out these retail services. 
But in concept, the Fed could do something similar to what banks are already doing, using banks or not, depending on how they design the program. A token-based central bank digital currency is quite different. It would attempt to mimic cash. Um, but there are limits to how similar a token can be to cash, because a token is not actually a physical object like cash, a token-based CBDC. It's called a token, but it's not actually a physical object. A token-based CBDC is actually technologically a lot more like an account-based CBDC than cash. It's a ledger entry. Um, and it's a ledger entry designed to have certain cash-like properties. For example, a token can be recorded in a distributed ledger so that people can exchange it with each other without the involvement of a central counterparty like the central bank. So uh, token-based CBDCs are sort of like the rabbit duck illusion. Their advantages are their disadvantages and vice versa. For example, you can lose your token just like you can lose cash. Um, there are no tellers to call if your token is stolen. Um, in theory, you can anonymize transactions uh, made in tokens. Um, you know, in reality, everything is recorded in a di digital ledger. So whatever procedures are put in place to keep token transactions private could probably also be put in place to make account transactions private. Another duck rabbit feature of tokens is how they plug into the existing money and banking system. So an account based CBDC would be seamlessly integrated. If you have an account at the Fed, you can immediately write checks and wires to other bank accounts. If you have a token, you have to go through a bank to make payments to people with, with, with account balances. So tokens preserve the positions of incumbent financial institutions. They do not clearly substitute for the account balances those institutions already provide. Nonetheless, tokens could be quite disruptive to the status quo. Uh, and this is largely because it will be hard to, up, to limit the uptake of tokens. So say, for example, the Fed issues only $1 trillion in tokens, hoping to keep most of the money supply it deposits in cash. Um, what happens if people want more tokens than that? The central bank could be in a bind. If it does not issue more tokens to banks to give to their customers, the value of tokens might exceed par. A $1 token could end up being worth $1.10. So no matter what shape a CDB, CBDC takes, it's likely to have substantial effects on the structure of our monetary system. Thanks, Lev. That's a great uh, way of uh, kicking us off. I think that um, both these kinds of systems of central bank digital currency, you know, pose some real um, questions. I wonder, you know, how you think and how Adrian you think about the disrupt potential disruption of account-based systems to our system of uh, fractional reserve banking. Uh, are we going to eventually end up in a place where if the Federal Reserve, for example, pursued an account-based approach, you'd get disintermediation in the banking system? And would the Federal Reserve then need to make credit allocation decisions? Is it lending in the economy too? Or how do you see this playing out um, really, you know, in real terms on the ground? Maybe, Adrian, you could kick us off on that. And, and Lev, I'd love your thoughts too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, you know, it's probably unlikely in the U.S. that we would have a completely disintermediated um, system, right? We've got a system now where we work, as you alluded to, Michael and Lev, through the banks uh, to get money to most of the population, right? Save some of these government entities and corporations, as, as Lev mentioned. Um, but the rest of us get our accounts and, and use our money through a system of commercial banks, the JP Morgans, the city groups of the world. It's conceivable that the Fed or another central bank could take on an accounts-based approach and disintermediate the banks. It's also conceivable that you could have a blended option of these things, right? And that consumers could choose whether or not they wanted to have an account at, say, the Fed or continue to have their account at a JP Morgan Chase, a Bank of America. And so I think we'll just have to see how things develop. And I guess the Fed could decide to, to offer its Fed accounts through banks rather than directly, rather than taking on a retail role. Absolutely. Yeah. So one, one approach is to partner with banks and have the banks perform the customer service and the fraud protection on behalf of the federal government, on behalf of the central bank. And so 
the, the Fed account holder, as it were, would still hold sovereign non-defaultable money for which there's no deposit insurance because none is needed, um, but you're still interfacing with a bank um, that is um, uh, that is performing various services on the, on behalf of the government. And in many respects, such a model um, is a continuation of the current design where uh, the deposit balances that banks, privately owned banks issue are largely backstopped by the government uh, already. And part of the reason for the privately owned banking system is to keep the government out of credit allocation and also to have the private sector play a role in managing uh, the day-to-day -day business of payments. Lev, do you want to um, maybe kick off the next series of questions? Yeah, sure. So I think a, a good question to, to go to now, and maybe this one's for you, Michael, is to what extent uh, do we see central bank digital currencies as a, as a good solution for financial inclusion, as a way to, to improve access to the money and payment system for current, uh, for current groups of, and populations that are perhaps excluded? Well, the short answer, Lev, is I'm not sure. I think the case really needs to be made. Uh, the upside potential would be that with more direct access to the payment system, you can lower the cost and improve services uh, for uh, low-income individuals. They potentially could be able to get their funds faster uh, and, at, and at lower cost. I think that the the real question is whether financial inclusion would be prioritized in any new system. Uh, right now, we have a system that uh, payment system that doesn't work very well for low income households uh, in the United States or globally. So, to come up with a payment system that actually serves uh, low income households, you need to be intentional about it. You need to start with the idea that that's your goal and you need to build a system uh, that meets their needs. I think it's really an open question whether central bank digital currency is the easiest route to do that or whether improvements to the existing payment system would get you there faster. Uh, moving to real-time payments uh, would certainly um, uh, in many ways help uh, low-income individuals uh, getting rid of the period of float uh, that financial institutions hang on to funds uh, and providing those funds directly uh, when they are available, when they, when they come into the bank um, to low-income people. And then figuring out how to expand access to appropriate products and services uh, for low-income people. It's not just about uh, having access to the account. Is, is the account set up and designed in a way uh, that meets your needs, that helps you have control of your own uh, funds uh, when you need them, that lets you make payments when you want to make them. And I think uh, moving to uh, central bank digital currency could help solve those problems, uh, so could to improving the existing uh, a payment system. I, I think that uh, both really need to be explored. And I, I think it would be good to be skeptical about that in advance and hold people's feet to the fire to say, if you're really serious about financial inclusion, as one of the goals of central bank digital currency, show me that you're designing it to meet that goal first. Absolutely. And, and Michael, I'll just say, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. The design and the intentionality is so important here. So it's all well and good to say, well, here's this silver bullet that we could use to fix this problem around financial inclusion or around real-time payments. But it really does have to start with the intentionality of saying this is for financial inclusion purposes, this is for speed purposes, and building a system that then engenders trust in the very population it's meant to serve. I think part of what people find appealing about CBDC and, and Fed accounts potentially um, is not just speed, but also this issue around fees. We all know that often low-income consumers end up getting saddled with ridiculous fees from their banks, whether it's minimum balance fees or overdraft fees. Um, and certainly there is a design of account-based CBDC that could solve for that. 
but it does have to be the intention of the government, the intention of the stakeholders to make that happen and really solve the problems. And I think you're absolutely right. It's completely an open question. Do we need to move to a completely new system or add on these new features, or can that be accomplished with the system we have today? How do you all see the competitive landscape here? I mean, is you've got uh, lots of um, uh, lots of payments, mobile payments happening around the world that uh, provide a lot of convenience for consumers. Uh, most of those are riding kind of on the old payments rail, uh, on the credit card system rail or the banking system rail. How do you see CBDC and crypto more generally? competing in that space? Is it a competitive product, a, a complementary product? What do you, how do you see the competitive landscape playing out? So I'll jump in here. I mean, I think, you know, certainly in the near term, we're going to see these things as complementary products. If for no other reason than change management is hard and slow, and especially if you're talking about something as large and as global as the payment systems, uh, so I think for there will be some time here in the in the future, the next five years or so, where we're seeing all of these payment systems, whether it's credit rails and debit rails and different kinds of digital currencies and fiat digital currencies, all sort of overlapping um, and providing consumers with a lot of choice, which can be a good thing. There may come a time when some of these things become fully replaced with either fiat digital currencies like CBDCs, or we may stick with a, a landscape that does have a range of options um, for people both domestically. You might have a different set of options when you think about cross-border payments. Um, but I do think that progression, uh, even if we were going to go to a, a completely new system of just CBDC, is going to take some time. So in the meantime, we will have, I think, a highly competitive landscape, and we'll see how consumers operate with it and what they choose to use and for what purposes. Uh, you know, I, I would just add to that, I think Adrian's got it exactly right, is that design, again, will really matter here, um, just as it matters for the financial inclusion. And so the public central banks will have a choice about how to design their CBDC offerings and how they design them will really have a big impact on what role other forms of money are likely to play in the coming decades. And if we go with an account-based system that uses banks, that's going to look, that's going to have one sort of shape to it. If central banks pursue some type of token solution that maybe stays within domestic borders, there will still be a lot of demand for and room for private cryptocurrency solutions that potentially ease cross-border payments. And so the coming years are going to tell us a lot more about what the coming decades look like as central banks start to make critical decisions about the design of their potential offerings. I think that's right, Lev. And you know, a lot of um, a lot of energy for CBDC uh, seems to have risen from uh, two kind of primary pushes. One is uh, com countries thinking about the rise of private cryptocurrency and thinking that they needed to compete. Uh, in particular, when uh, the announcement was made about Libra, uh, the potential Facebook-backed uh, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, that seemed to have accelerated moves um, all over the world in examining uh, uh, central bank digital currency as a competitor to private cryptocurrency. And of course, there's a, a basic dilemma whenever you have private money creation that uh, at the end of the day, either somebody's really going to lose badly or a government somewhere is going to step in in a crisis and make it public money. Uh, we've seen that uh, through hundreds of years of uh, the history of currency. Uh, so countries may be worried in, in that score. And then the second major impetus, I know um, both of you have done some thinking about this, is uh, countries, other countries looking at the dominance of the U.S. dollar. Uh, in global markets and thinking that uh, digital currency might uh, help those countries uh, compete more effectively against the dollar as a reserve currency. Uh, we, we've had explicit statements to that effect from Cambodia. Uh, certainly, uh, a lot of people think that's um, behind China's uh, strong push uh, into digital currency. 
uh, and even the EU as um, uh, recently as uh, last week uh, was talking about uh, digital uh, euros as a counterweight to uh, U.S. Uh, reserve currencies dominance. So how do you all think about, how do you guys think about this? Are these good motivations for pursuing um, CBDC? You know, what do they lead you to think about the shape that country is going to take in this way in the future? Yeah, it's a great question, Michael. So it's not surprising to see that the various countries that are exploring this are quite concerned with their monetary sovereignty because control over the money supply has always been of core concern to states, to governments. Governments use money to tax and spend, and it's literally the lifeblood of the state. And states that lose control of their money and the ability to modulate their economies by modulating the supply of money within them um, can tend to really hit on hard, to, hard times and tend, can really struggle. And so it's not surprising to see even a country like Canada um, in exploring CBDC options say, say quite explicitly, we may not go down this road, but if there's any doubt that the Canadian dollar is going to be the primary um, or near exclusive means of payment within the domestic Canadian economy, then we are prepared to pursue a Canadian dollar CBDC. And so I think a lot of countries will end up in that sort of posture where they don't necessarily uh, plan as uh, to introduce uh, a, a, either a token or account-based uh, digital currency issued by their central bank, but as a plan B are prepared to do so uh, if they see other countries um, or private organizations issuing such tokens um, or account-based um, digital currencies that then get take up within, within their economies. Um, then there's a different category, I'll just add, uh, you know, a country like China that might have an actual desire to not just protect the monetary sovereignty, its own monetary sovereignty to ensure that the yuan is the near exclusive means of payment within China, but actually aim to uh, promote the yuan as a means of payment in other countries around the world. And uh, there's a lot of reason to believe that China, which is at the leading edge of central di digital currency design um, right now, uh, has very much in mind the possibility of um, exporting the yuan to other countries in the, in the years to come. Yeah, I think Lev is, is absolutely right here. I mean, different countries have their different motivations for exploring CBDC. From the U.S. perspective, though, I do think it is, as a policy matter, something um, that the U.S. government, that the Federal Reserve should be very attuned to. As we look to, to maintain the primacy of the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency, um, and obviously there are more factors at play here than just the digitization of of a fiat currency, right? There is trust and stability and the size of the economy. Um, but all of those things, right? I mean, it's not just that that China is moving so quickly on a CBDC, but the size of their economy, you know, their stability, if you think about them as a, a very large global player, certainly, but as you think about the, their relative strength in, in Asia. Um, and so US policymakers certainly have to be attuned to these dynamics and can't rest on their laurels. I think that's a really important caution, Adrian. And I do think, um, you know, you're going to see very aggressive moves by um, China trying to expand its own uh, digital currency in the coming uh, months and years, uh, in part because of that a broader role it wants to play and, and is starting to play on the global stage, uh, perhaps starting with Asia. But, but more broadly, I think there's a desire to uh, displace the U.S. Uh, role in that area. You've seen some uh, indication um, from the U.S. Federal Reserve that it's um, starting to take this uh, issue seriously. Uh, Leo Brainerd, Governor Brainerd, announced that um, the Fed is conducting studies, uh, some on its own, some some with MIT, trying to think through the mechanics side of the issues. The uh, Deputy Treasury Secretary has um, indicated that Treasury is looking at these issues. So I do think you're seeing some movement 
in response uh, on the U.S. Uh, side as well. It'll be interesting to see how it'll play out. You know, one of the um, one of the things people uh, think about in terms of central bank digital currency is uh, could relief efforts around the world um, have been deployed more quickly in COVID-19 with a central bank digital currency as a backbone? I wonder, have you guys seen any um, uh, any movement in this that that is promising? Uh, countries that are doing a good job getting out COVID relief quickly. Um, any any examples or or um, suggestions you get from that about the way in which uh, technological innovation might advance benefit payments around the world? C certainly. So, um, you know. In a country like Germany, where there's already extremely high bank account penetration, 99% plus, a CBDC doesn't necessarily offer much, um, make, would, would not make much of a marginal difference uh, in helping the German government um, make emergency aid payments. And in fact, I think we saw earlier this year, the German government was extremely efficient and effective in pushing emergency aid payments out to its citizens. In a country like the United States, however, where bank account penetration is substantially lower, where there are millions of households that do not have uh, bank accounts. Uh, the COVID crisis has really revealed a problem in our money and payment system um, and, and, and a, an acute problem, especially in the case of, of a pandemic, because the government has no way of sending money to these households quickly, can't send it digitally. And when the government sends these households a check, the households have no account to deposit it in. And so they end up using expensive check cashers and they have to go in person, um, which raises community transmission problems, tens of thousands of people physically transacting, in some sense, unnecessarily. If you were able to um, have some type of um, public option for digital money or uh, some type of arrangement that brought up the amount of banked households to 99% plus, it would be much easier for the government to push out emergency aid payments um, instantly, digitally, and safely. Thanks, Lev. Adrian, uh, further thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, I couldn't agree more with Lev. I think if we had a more direct way um, to, to get people aid money um, without not just them I mean, having to go to check cashers and pay fees, but also without that time lag that's created by having to send checks. And and frankly, even the time lag with the existing payment system as we, we know it today, I think that would really be to the benefit of consumers. But Michael, you know, given the role you played in financial reform after the last crisis, would love to hear your take on this as well. Yeah, I, I do think that um, uh, progress on central bank digital currencies could really improve the government's uh, delivery system. Uh, it, it's one channel uh, potentially that should be explored much, much, uh, much more uh, carefully and closely. I would love to see us make progress even within the existing system. There's so much that we could do uh, that we haven't done to expand access to financial services for low-income people, to make bank accounts safe and affordable, uh, to reduce the costs uh, of uh, transactions, to reduce the kind of gotcha um, fees that are involved in many bank accounts, the contingent fees, overdraft fees, uh, insufficient fund fees, um, to make good funds available immediately, um, uh, to reduce the need to use overdraft or payday loans or other expensive items. And lastly, a topic we haven't really um, touched on yet, and that's control of one's own financial data. Uh, we have a system right now where it's extremely hard for consumers uh, to use the information that is really about their own transactions uh, to be able to switch accounts, to dump their bank account when they're not being treated right, to switch to an account that would treat them better. Uh, and better competition in this marketplace could drive down costs and improve services for low-income households. So I'd love to see progress on all these fronts using technological advances. I know we only have about a minute or two left. Maybe we'll each um, say just uh, 30 seconds on, um, you know, there's been so much movement in the last, um, in the last even few months on central bank digital currency. 
what do you all see as the future? If you had to just pull out um, five years from now and say, what does the landscape look like? Uh, who's come out of the box with um, uh, aggressive action here? What does the competitive space look like? Try and put yourself in the position five years from now. What did the last five years look like? Where should we be going next? And I, I promise I'll, I'll say my mind as well, but Adrian, do you want to start us off and then Lev? Sure. I mean, I think as has been the case with technology generally over the last decade, we're just going to continue to see an acceleration in the development of this technology and, and CBDC. Uh, and so we'll see more countries come online with their R&D and full implementation of CBDC. I think we'll continue to see, as we've seen with Singapore and, and Canada, lots of partnership and experimentation about CBDC and how it relates to cross-border payments. Um, and I think we're just going to continue to see the payments landscape generally continue to innovate and have enhanced competition so that consumers have more and more options. And I think to your point, Michael, hopefully the, the acceleration with digital currency will be coupled with advances in how we think about consumer data, allowing consumers to, to really exercise that choice about where they get their financial services needs met, but also about their ability to make good financial decisions for themselves. I'll just Let add about that your the one thing I... Yeah, I'll just add that the one thing I I feel fairly confident in predicting is that five years from now, the digital yuan will be a, the dominant currency within China and possibly uh, have spread to many other countries in the Asia Pacific area. I think that with respect to the rest of the world, the next year is gonna tell us a lot and that this time next year, we'll be able to predict uh, much more accurately what other countries are going to do about the rise of the digital yuan and how they are going to um, handle the transition to potentially introducing their own CBDCs. Thanks, Lev. I, I do think it's going to be a fascinating time. I think the pressure from China and the pressure from the rise of private cryptocurrencies is really going to force uh, both the U.S. and Europe uh, to be serious about a, a central bank digital currency. What form that'll take, how it'll get rolled out, who would be involved? Uh, I don't know. Those are super hard questions to be to be determined. But I, I do worry that uh, if the United States is not um, taking this issue seriously, that we could see either a rise of a, a digital currency in China that uh, is providing real competition for the United States, or uh, the rise of uh, the use of private cryptocurrencies that I think uh, pose significant um, systemic risks uh, in the event that uh, a crisis were to occur or the difficulty in that private cryptocurrency, would governments around the world be forced to step in? So I think that those, both those pressures are going to force a significant change in the future. Well, our time's up. This has been a delightful conversation. It's great seeing you, Adrian and Lev, again. And uh, thanks to all of our audience for joining us. And I hope you're enjoying the entire conference. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone you are in. Uh, let me start by introducing our uh, esteemed moderator for this panel on institutional digital asset uh, adoption. Zoe Cruz is going to moderate the panel. She's no stranger to financial markets. She's had over four decades of markets experience, always from a capital flows perspective. Zoe Cruz had a 20-year tenure, 25-year tenure at Morgan Stanley. She was co-president there from 2005 to 2007. She was responsible for running major revenue-generating businesses, including overseeing their securities risk management and information technology. Prior to becoming co-president of Morgan Stanley, 
Zoe was the global head of fixed income, commodities and foreign exchange from 2001 until 2005. She joined the company in 1982 and was the third founding member of the foreign exchange trading group. Most recently, Zoe was the founder of an investment management firm, Boris Capital Management, senior advisor at Promontory Financial Group, as the, and is the founder and CEO of EOZ Global, a single family office. She's also a strategic advisor to Ripple. Zoe, all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Rina. I'm very honored to introduce the three panelists today. Uh, Rina, Dr. Rina Agarwal is the director of Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy and professor of finance at Georgetown University. She specializes in global financial markets as well as governance. Uh, and she had uh, various positions, including interim dean and deputy dean of Georgetown's McDonough School of Business visiting professor of finance at MIT, and she's been involved with various, various activities around the globe that further uh, governance uh, on a global scale. Professor Jim Angel is an associate professor at the McDonough School of Business. Uh, professor Angel specializes in the market structure and regulation of global financial markets, a very important field, as you might uh, guess, and he has visited over 70 financial exchanges around the world. He has also served as a visiting academic fellow in residence at the NASDAQ, uh, now FINRA, yes, NASD, NASDAQ, and also as a visiting economist at the Shanghai Stock Exchange. Uh, Dr. Silvia Bertolucci is a lecturer at University College London. Uh, her research focuses on the intersection of financial markets and cryptocurrencies, which is a very hot topical field, as you can also imagine. She has authored research on the impact of development practices on cryptocurrency prices and the Lightning Network. She's been a highly engaged degree researcher. And we're looking very forward to hearing from her and the other two on this panel. So with that, uh, I guess I will begin before I ask a couple of questions of the panel to give you um, a few minutes of my uh, macro uh, thoughts on the world, given the fact that I had a front seat in the last four decades of global finance. I got out of business school in 1982 and joined Morgan Stanley, which at the time was a private company it had 2,000 people and it had three offices, Tokyo, London, New York. When I left in 07, it was 60,000 people. It had offices everywhere and obviously it um, witnessed uh, a torrential growth in uh, cross-border uh, capital flows. Uh, that growth, as I've said, in terms of the torrential growth thereof, um, when I started in the business of global finance, uh, the stocks and bonds globally, public stocks and bonds were $12 trillion. Uh, and now it's a hair under $200 trillion. In 82, the risk-free rate of return of government bonds, 30-year treasuries were 14%. And as you know, right now, they're oscillating slightly above zero. Um, the basic framework uh, on which uh, invest, how you allocate, uh, or how you allocate assets across a portfolio, stayed pretty much the same. 60, 40, 40, 60, if you were not as uh, positive on bonds, a few other diversifier assets. But for the four decades of this tremendous change, um, portfolio allocation theory has been using pretty much the same framework. So that framework that still ex exists today uh, basically assumes a few very important things, that stocks and bonds are negatively correlated with each other, uh, that both are agents of free markets, how you value them are agents of free markets, inflation rates will stay low for longer, 
and rates obviously as a result will stay long or low for longer so in this backdrop of the biggest bond bull market fixed income bull market in history um a hundred trillion of those bonds that i've mentioned earlier um 80 percent eight all 80 percent of those bonds return zero to negative real rates of return and the 90 trillion of the stock portfolio is in extreme bubble category by any measure uh, that we've used in the past. Um, the last time it was in this territory was in 1929 and in the year 2001. We all know what happened then. The final point I will make is that uh, there there's also regime change now in terms of fiscal policy uh, was used to uh, restart economies in the short term. So you basically had a very aggressive fiscal policy as a short term, um, as a short term uh, lever uh, to basically stimulate short term demand. We are now talking about trillions, multi-trillion dollar uh, fiscal policy uh, pursued um to solve much longer term uh issues such as possibly recurring pandemics and possibly disastrous climate changes we're talking about multi-trillion dollar programs going for both of those things so um the um when you have unprecedented leverage that results in misallocation of capital that results from zero to negative re, uh, hurdle rates and you have zero to negative growth which is where we have what we have now i don't need to say anyone to this panel or to the to the audience uh, that uh, you don't need to predict a crisis financial crisis but you certainly can say unequivocally the probability of a financial crisis is rising exponentially um and you know uh i before i start basically with the questions given this macro environment i will say my experience in uh, morgan stanley in 05 and 06 people lost their jobs their careers were hurt by being negative on u.s mortgages and if you remember up until 07 equities were making new highs so i don't know if this is 05 or 06 or 07 but um, we are in that zip code. So given this macro environment, um, how do you think digital assets fit into the portfolio of a large institutional uh, manager? And I'll begin with you, Jim. Uh, well, thank you for asking. Now, one thing to remember is large institutional managers are you know, very bureaucratic, very inertial. You know, they want to see a, a long track record and they want to see other people go first. They're going to wait for the early adopters to show performance. But when we think about digital assets, there are really three categories. You've got security tokens that I think will you know, take off as uh, a function of the underlying value created by those companies. We've got utility to tokens you can do things with and payment tokens, which are basically pitched as a store of value, as a hedge against collapse. Well, the problem is hedging is costly. You know, when you buy insurance, it only pays off in that catastrophic situation. Under most normal conditions that you hope are not happening, they don't pay off. So, and I think the more intelligent institutional investors realize this. So, you know, unless they really need that hedge for that catastrophic situation, they're going to step back. So remember, hedge assets are costly. Okay. Um, Rina, what do you have to add to that? What do you have to add to that? Yeah, uh, so, so uh, thank you for laying out uh, the macro conditions right now, which are uh, pretty unique in many different ways. And uh, before I uh, start answering your uh, question, the issue that you raised, I, I just want to thank Ripple and uh, Ubri and Ubri Connect for bringing us together and getting uh, different universities and partners to be working with each other. So uh, thank you, Lauren and the team for putting on a fantastic program here. Okay. 
so uh, going back to the issue that you raised, Zoe, uh, I think especially in this environment that we are in, investors are really looking for non-traditional assets to include in their portfolios. And the digital assets have some qualities, right? They are uh, similar to maybe like gold. They are divisible, they are durable, they are fungible, they hold value. And then there's another unique aspect that there's limited supply of these assets. And uh, as Jim said, people are waiting to see if the other person go first and then we'll get on the bandwagon. And that's starting to happen. And I think as, uh, for example, the CME group now has uh, futures and options as these new kinds of contracts are introduced and uh, you have the Fidelities and the JP Morgan and the Goldman's of the world starting to get a little bit more comfortable with these assets. Now, we just saw the announcement that Square is holding a significant amount of Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Uh, I think all of these factors are really leading to investors, including these assets in their portfolio. However, uh, so you talked about the trillions in the financial markets, uh, the market cap of these digital assets, it's still tiny. It's uh, pretty small. Okay. Yes. I'll and Sylvia? Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. So I, I also agree with, with Rina and Jim that there are uh, significant frictions for investors to approach this, this space. Although it's, it is true that assets are making their way into the portfolio of large institutional investors, family offices, uh, high net worth individuals, but in different forms. So from very simple types of investment, like buying crypto from exchanges to more sophisticated uh, vehicles. We can think of crypto indices or tokenization of, uh, um, uh, of the equity of blockchain companies, for example. It is also true that uh, most investors tend to choose Bitcoin, which is the oldest and most trustworthy in a way currency. Um, there's been a recent uh, survey of, of investors who among those uh, about 25% uh, chose Bitcoin as, as their investment. Uh, but going back to uh, Rina and uh, Jim's point, because of the uncertainty and uh, the future evolution of this sector, there is indeed, in my opinion, like a uh, benefit into diversifying not only the portfolio in terms of crypto and non-crypto assets, but also diversifying within the portfolio of crypto assets. So uh, for instance, to include the top performing assets that can be characterized by their market capitalization, their number of transactions, and many other measures that are used. Um, research in this area is looking precisely at how to, to create to an optimal composition of this portfolio, how to um, rank dynamically the digital asset based on their performances, and how the risk return essentially varies by changing the basket of crypto. Uh, how much the portfolio should be crypto? Well, this is a matter of the risk profile of the investors, but investors expect to have at least 1% of their portfolio in the next couple of years made of uh, digital assets. Well, that's a very important point considering the numbers we were talking about, because even at 1% of uh, $190 trillion, you're talking about $2 trillion flying out. <laughs> into, as Rina mentioned earlier, into very small cap um, kind of uh, cryptocurrencies. So the diversification of portfolios, the first, in my experience, what we're seeing, uh, the first uh, step was gold uh, as a hedge against possible inflation, uh, finite numbers, because if you're printing free fiat currencies, you know, as we all, I've gone back to reread books on the Weimar Republic, on the great crash of 29, and it's kind of scary how history certainly rhymes. <laughs> so uh, the first exodus is into gold, into uh, copper and silver, and now a decentralized finance, as you've mentioned, is the new, new thing. And within that, uh, as you say, I know there is a lot of great work that's being done, once you decide to go into the cryptocurrency world, what is a diversified portfolio? 
So you don't pick a winner, you think it's a winner, but it may end up being the Netscape of the winner back in 2000. So how do you avoid that uh, is by having a diversified portfolio. So Fidelity actually uh, is very active in the space, as you all know, uh, best in class institutional investors. Um, they conducted a survey recently of 800 institutional investors and found some pretty earth-shaking statistics, I would say. 74% of US investors, 82% of European investors find digital assets appealing, at least to consider. Of those 27% in the US and 45% in Europe, they're currently invested in digital assets already. Uh, why do you think the European investors are leaning more aggressively in this massive trend than the U.S. investors at the moment. So, Sylvia, let's begin with you. Yes, uh, thanks. So, I would like to start by adding maybe a positive note uh, to this data, um, by saying that from already from 2018 to 2019, the proportion of investors in the U.S. with a positive uh, perception of this this digital assets have already increased by more than 8%. So I guess this is a this is a, a good number saying telling us that something is moving and also rather quickly also in the US ecosystems. Uh, going back to the sort of difference between Europe and US, uh, it is true that in Europe there are countries uh, such as Switzerland uh, we can, with uh, its well-known Crypto Valley ecosystems. We have Luxembourg, we have um, Malta, which has recently attracted a large share of the digital asset industry, especially that connected to the gaming industry. And all those countries essentially have moved forward to develop a progressive and accommodating framework that are essentially helping companies in the space to flourish. Uh, just by a final example, which is more local, uh, in, here in the UK, um, between 2018 and 2019, the Financial Conduct Authority has sort of started uh, a public uh, consultation uh, with academics, with uh, stakeholders uh, in, in the space uh, that led to the creation of uh, guidance and taxonomy of digital assets. Of course, uh, this is not the, the final uh, the final uh, regulation uh, that will be drawn on, on digital asset, but it was certainly very useful to reduce ambiguity within the sector and encourage investors to approach it as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Rina, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so I would uh, echo what uh, Sylvia said uh, in terms of sort of the regulatory structure. So in the U.S., uh, we do have a very strong regulatory structure, which is which is very good for the long run. But uh, it's a complex structure. It's very fragmented, right? So not only digital assets and crypto, but in general, I would say fintech has made a lot of progress in other countries. Uh, faster, there's a lot more going on, uh, whether it's uh, the peer-to-peer -peer lending or it's a digital wallet. Uh, you see uh, suddenly Europe, you also see Asia where a lot more progress has been made. So uh, I think the regulatory issues are one of the issues. We lost you actually, I don't know, can, can the rest? Now I can, yeah, well, you came back. No, can't hear you. Sorry, Rina. Can the rest of you hear Rina? Is it just me? I no. can't hear Rina, but let me uh, emphasize okay. what uh, Rina was saying and say it still more forcefully. You know, in the United States, we have serious problems with the regulatory structure. It's not such fragmented, it's obsolete and dysfunctional. And it's uh, leading to some serious problems, you know, which is why we're you know, getting behind in this uh, very important new technology. Yeah. It's a real issue. And uh, before we move to the next question, I would say it's a very, very important issue. I'm a huge believer in uh, regulation because I think after 1929, the crash of 29, it took decades of great thinking in regulatory frameworks 
that created the deepest, most transparent market in the world, the U.S. equity markets. So I do believe this is a very important thing that we get right for the next 40 years, as the previous regulators had done in the last uh, three, three, four decades. So moving on to, uh, I know we're running out of uh, time here, but what do you think are the barriers to invest if still out there? Because obviously the barriers are coming down for institutional investors to invest in digital assets. And are they different between US and Europe? We got a flavor for that. But what are the barriers maybe globally still? And let's begin with you, Rina. Yes, so, so a couple of things I know we'll uh, run out of time. Uh, so one issue is the whole price discovery mechanism, right? Anytime there are new assets, uh, it tends to happen that uh, uh, you're not sure what to trust and what not to trust. So, for example, the secondary market activity in uh, these uh, digital assets, uh, there are more than 200 exchanges uh, and they're not regulated and there are concerns about fake volume. So that's one issue. Another issue is I think people are still struggling. They're trying to figure out how do you determine the fundamental value of these assets, right? Uh, what does that depend on? Then there are issues about institutional investors need custody. They need prime brokerage services for these products. And these are starting to develop, but are not quite there yet. So all of this about price discovery, manipulation, secondary market, and the associated services, uh, these these need to come up to speed for uh, for the market to take off. Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, Sylvia, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yes, I do. Also, I, I agree with with Rina that, of course, the um, the valuation is an important uh, point here. Uh, in particular, we really need a robust and tested framework for digital asset. I do believe that if we are able to uh, answer questions in some questions related to what are the real drivers of the adoption and the value of digital assets, then investors will be encouraged to, to, um, to enter this uh, space of investments. Um, and of course, the important question are whether this value comes from, uh, for instance, the use case digital assets are designed for or whether it's driven by the intrinsic features of um, of the assets, for instance, is a is a digital asset that is that is, that is based on a more secure underlying cryptographic uh, protocol more valuable than other. Um, so I think that if we are able to answer this question, uh, we will encourage uh, more investment in this space. Right. In terms of Europe, I guess that despite all this uncertainty, as you said at the beginning, Zoe, the prevalence of uh, negative yield rates uh, sort of makes still the digital asset a good uh, protection from wealth erosion and an alternative to standard investment. So just on that point, we'll leave five minutes for Q&A. Uh, I understand. Sorry, Jim, go ahead, please. Oh, I just wanted to add one more point, and that is custody. You know, how do you prove to your investment committee or to your auditors that you actually have custody of a particular digital asset? How do you prove that you're the only one who has those digital keys and no one else has it? So this is a, a big sticking point for a lot of institutional investors. Yeah. So that's the, the uh, optimistic uh, point that there is literally hundreds of millions of dollars that are going into building the ecosystem, custody being one, as you know, Fidelity is building one. Uh, there are ex-financiers uh, from the regulated world that are running custody businesses that are actually best in class. It's beginning. Um, it hasn't stopped yet. But on that point, I feel that uh, there will be a catch-up between the mountains of money are looking for a home. The ecosystem is behind it, as you guys are, are have alluded to it. But when I think of all the investments that are going, real VC investments that are going into building the ecosystem, I think it will happen. It's, it's a matter of time. So on that point, I understand from all three of you are basically writing a book on investments and asset allocation from traditional portfolio into this cryptocurrency world. Do you care to share a little bit more about that seminal book? I'm sure there'll be a lot of us that are interested to read it. 
Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, again, uh, it's been terrific where Ubri has brought different universities together. So Georgetown is working with the University College London, Sylvia and her team, and uh, with Ubri. And really the focus of the book is going to be all the things we've talked about in this panel. It's about pricing, it's about valuation, allocation, regulation. And uh, we're hoping this book will be published in uh, 2021. And, uh, and uh, the information about the book, if you're interested in contributing a chapter, uh, you can find the information on our uh, respective websites. But uh, Sylvia, do you want to add something more on that? Um, well, I think, uh, as you said, we would like to stimulate a dialogue within the community. So we really much uh, look forward to your contribution too. We will share a link to our call for chapters in the chat later. Um, and I would like to finally thank you, Brie, Ripple and Georgetown uh, for their, this amazing collaboration. We are really excited at UCL about this book. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, since there are no uh, questions uh, on... Oh. Um, so there is a question from the audience that said, in the risk on event in March 2020, investors dumped stocks, gold and cryptos. When we switched to risk on, um, I guess the, the, uh, the issue is, if they're all correlated, the risk on trade, where is the diversifier? I think that's a fair question. Uh, I'd love to hear your view, but I would take a cut at answering this way. Correlations are extremely unstable over short periods of time. And I would say three to six months to a year, that's unstable. But over longer periods of time, actually, they, they do work. And I would say the basic thesis why they're negatively correlated uh, to me is the fact that these are finite, all the cryptocurrencies, the major cryptocurrencies are uh, finite in nature, as opposed to fiat currencies, you can print trillions and whether you're in the twenties where the Deutsche Mark was fine and then it wasn't, it was binary. And in the US, the dollar I think is in a long protracted decline. Within that you have dollar going down, going up, so I wouldn't take the last three months of risk on risk of cryptos behaving the way traditional assets are behaving as the predictor of the future. I don't know if any of you have uh, something to add or something different to add. Yes, so Zoya, I think you're absolutely right. Research has shown that during periods of severe prices or uh, issues in the market, the correlation tends to become higher. But then in the long run, the correlation might still be uh, low correlation. So it wasn't surprising to see that everything went down, but then now they're following different paths. Yeah. So I have one minute uh, remaining. Uh, so if anyone in that minute wants to add something to that, that's a very, very important uh, question to answer, but I guess we can well, always yeah, come I'll, back. I'll, yeah, I'm happy to add to that. I mean, what basically happened in March was, you know, everyone's discount rates went through the roof because of the uncertainty. So the present value of everything went down. You know, at other times, we have shocks that affect growth rates for stocks and bonds and cryptos differently. And so that's one of the reasons why short-term correlations are unstable, because the different shocks affect things in different ways. When something affects the discount rate universally, you expect everything to be positively correlated, you know, which is why when in a crisis, we say all correlations go to one. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, uh, all three of you, uh, and uh, I hope to see you soon and in person. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, -bye. thank you. My name is David Schwartz. I'm the CTO at Ripple. I'm going to be talking about the XRP ledger, pay ID, and the Internet of Value. Let me start by telling you a little bit about Ripple, the company I work for. We were founded in 2012. We have about 450 employees around the world, different offices. 
And uh, we're an enterprise blockchain-based company. We provide solutions primarily for cross-border payments. Our customers are primarily banks and financial institutions. They use our software to make payments, primarily international payments. Uh, many of our customers start with XCurrent for connectivity, but they're increasingly adopting our XRapid product to solve the pre-funding problem with on-demand liquidity. Our vision is the internet of value, enabling the world to move value like information moves today. That's a little bit abstract, so we try to describe our mission in slightly more concrete terms as enabling payments everywhere, every way, for everyone. And the way I like people to think about that is to think about how easy email is. You get somebody's email address and you can just communicate with them. It just works. And if any of you have made an international payment, you know that it is the very opposite of that level of convenience. We have the internet. We have easy shipment of physical goods. We have easy exchange of data, but payments are still stuck in the past. Our mission is to bring payments into that seamless future. The technology that we're using is blockchain. And I want to talk a little bit about where blockchain is and where it came from. And an analogy I like to use is the Ford Model T. The Ford Model T was a technological breakthrough, but it didn't have anything magic. There wasn't any fundament, there wasn't some new laws of physics. There wasn't, uh, it wasn't like nuclear power. It was a clever combination of existing parts. It was incremental improvements in things like um, engines, in terms of things like suspension, tires. There was small bits of innovation in all of those things, and Henry Ford combined them into a single product. And in the Model T stage, interesting things happen. There are skeptics and there are visionaries. Uh, people will start to ask, could the automobile replace the horse? And it would make sense for people to say, well, that's crazy. We use horses for everything. And the automobile is like this niche product. It's expensive. It can only go on paved surfaces. And there are all these limitations. Uh, but what you have to look at is, what are the new technology's advantages? What does it do better than the previous technology? When you look at the limitations of the new technology, the question to ask yourself is, are those limitations fundamental or can we get around them? The Ford Model T needed an oil change every 250 miles. That's not particularly convenient. But that's not a fundamental limitation of the automobile. That's a limitation of the Model T. And then what you have to ask is, what are we missing? What do we need for the Model T or, or its descendants to replace the horse? We need roads. We need gas stations. We need mechanics. We need technological improvements. And, and this is the stage where visionaries will start to look at a new technology and say, can this make a major impact? And of course, most of the time, those who say that a technology will make a major impact will be wrong. Most technologies don't make a major impact. But obviously, the, the shipping container, the internet, all did. And I think we'll show that blockchain will. So blockchain is in that state where it's starting to mature. I don't drive a Model T, and goods aren't delivered in Model Ts, right? Cars have specialized to trucks, vans, sports cars, aimed at different use cases. One size does not fit all. Uh, at the visionary stage, you might just have the Model T, and people will start imagining how, they, how extensions of that technology could solve their problems. But there has to be that maturity. And, and that's where we are with blockchain right now. Uh, right now, we have different applications like payments, decentralized finance, trade finance, equity settlement, gosh, even flower freshness. I mean, you, can, you name it, someone's trying to do it bl with blockchain. And obviously, some of those things are not going to be good fits, as commonly happens with many technologies. People try to apply the new technology to literally every problem. Sometimes that works. The internet uh, can be applied to almost every problem. And of course, sometimes it doesn't. But that's the stage that we're in now. That's where blockchain is. We're in that stage where the people who have the vision to see blockchain potentially as replacing a large number of existing technologies or even enabling new use cases and capabilities are trying to mature the technology to solve the real world problems. Uh, so what is blockchain? What's special about it? What I discovered when I started looking at blockchain in 2011 is that blockchains have certain characteristics that make them special. And the three that I think are the most important are system state is public, system rules are broadly enforced, and they're fault tolerant through simplicity by design. And I want to clarify like, what I mean by all of those points, because every one of them is important. By system state is public, I mean that the entire state of the system is accessible to anybody who needs to interact with the system. So what that means is if you want to interact with Bitcoin, you can see every account's Bitcoin balance. That information is entirely public. 
System rules being broadly enforced means that anybody who wants to interact with the Bitcoin system can enforce all of the system's rules. The system has certain rules. You can't create Bitcoin out of nowhere. There's a certain block reward. There's a, you need to sign a transaction to move Bitcoin. And those rules aren't enforced by some central system operator. They're enforced by everyone. And importantly, the fault tolerance is through simplicity by design. We have fault tolerant systems like the electric grid, for example, or even many conventional databases. But their fault tolerance comes from complexity. The electric grid is managed, there's excess capacity, there's balancing that goes on. It's very complex. And the problem with complex fault tolerance is you have complex failure modes. They're very good at handling like what I would call a normal failure, where one component doesn't do what it's supposed to do and just stops doing things. But they have great difficulty with abnormal failure modes. Like for example, a, a conventional database might have a fault mode where, two, where both a primary and a secondary or backup database system think that the other one has failed. And so they're in a dual active state, which is not tolerated well by the system. Blockchains have fault tolerance through design simplicity uh, and through broad enforcement of system rules. No party can violate the rules because every party enforces it. So many failure modes are just structurally impossible. If the question is, what is blockchain's secret sauce? I believe it's those three things. And I think that's why blockchains are so reliable. Digital currencies were blockchain's first use case. The first blockchains were built for digital currencies, Bitcoin. The first blockchain was built for Bitcoin, the digital currency. In fact, uh, it created a lot of confusion in that the people d failed to realize that those were two different things. Bitcoin is an asset. It's a payment system. Uh, and those are logically distinct. Um, and other use cases have been built on top of those chains. So this is an interesting point. Ethereum built on top of a digital currency, Ether and then started layered smart contracts on top of that. But this is a historical accident. In theory, a digital currency is an application for a blockchain or an application for a decentralized ledger system. Uh, and, and in an ideal world, we would have just built uh, blockchains first as decentralized um, database systems, and then digital currencies would have been one application that could have been layered on top of them along with other applications. That didn't happen due to a historical accident. And uh, I think there's great value in sort of rebuilding blockchains from first principles, forgetting about digital currencies so that they can tackle other use cases uh, that involve online transaction processing and that can benefit from things like having the system rules being enforced and the, the better resilience against failure modes. So digital currencies are built on blockchains. They inherit the fact that state and rules are public and all participants can enforce rules, but they have another interesting attribute that you don't have to do this in blockchain, but digital currencies do do this. There are no system administrative functions. There's nobody who has special authorization to modify the system. Changes to system rules or abnormal uh, transitions that don't follow the system's rules notionally require the consent of literally every single participant in the ecosystem. So for example, if you want to change the maximum number of Bitcoins from a little over 21 million to say 30 million, literally every Bitcoin participant has to agree to that change or they will not be affected by it. Now, of course, in practice, if 90% of them agree to the change, the other 10% won't have much choice. They would be in their own little island. But at least notionally, until that 10% agrees to that change, that change will not affect them. So they're governed by sort of, they're, they're brutally democratic, essentially. There are not uh, authorized system administrators, and that's an important attribute of digital currencies, and it makes them different from all previous assets except maybe physical cash. XRP, the digital asset that I worked on developing, um, we think is the digital asset for payments. We built it for payments. In particular, the settlement time is much quicker just a couple of seconds. The fees are much lower. The throughput is higher. Energy consumption is lower. It's been operating for something like uh, eight years now without any significant difficulties. And it uses, instead of proof of work, it uses a confederated Byzantine agreement algorithm that we called consensus, which provides better predictability. And I think, that, I think that's important. You want fees to be stable. The fees in most many other systems are widely varying. And you want settlement time to be stable. That three to seven seconds is partially system variation, but it's also just this question of how you, how you measure uh, time. Do you measure it from when a transaction is formed, from when it's accepted? And it, not, not necessary to get into the details, but it's a, it's a fairly consistent settlement time. You can be very highly assured that your transaction will settle within seven seconds if you pay even a pretty minimal fee. And that's something that most other blockchains don't have. And I think that's important in the payments use case where reliability and stability are fundamental. Uh, here you can see a chart comparing XRP's performance to the performance of other major digital assets. And you can see that in those attributes like security, speed, cost, uh, consistency, XRP is a real winner. And that's why we think it is the best digital asset for payments. 
Over 58 million ledgers have closed roughly every today, about every five seconds. Initially, it was a little slower because demand was lower. Uh, and XRP is easily available on over 140 exchanges, so it's not difficult for someone to acquire XRP or convert it back into fiat if that's what they want to do. I want to talk about some of the XRP ledger innovations because I'm very proud of them, and I think it's also important to understand the technological innovation that's gone on behind the XRP ledger. So one thing is its federated Byzantine agreement algorithm. I know people kind of forget about this today, but back in 2011 when we started working on it, there was a belief that proof of work was Bitcoin's secret sauce rather than those things I talked about, about transaction state being public, systems rules being broadly enforced, lack of administrative functions and so on. But what we, uh, what we realized was that proof of work was just the solution to the double spend problem. It wasn't, it wasn't key. And in fact, it was one of the things that made Bitcoin both slow and expensive and it actually uh, doesn't decentralize because people who can mine efficiently tend to look similar. And so it actually is a centralizing tendency that the other stakeholders have to work against. Another important thing is that transactions operate on views and views are checked for invariant violations. This is a very significant technological innovation. It improves performance, but the main thing it does is it improves security. Uh, I'll give you an example of how to think about that. Imagine if someone said to me, hey, David, how do you know that someone can't just submit a transaction that creates a whole bunch of new XRP? That would obviously be very bad. Without these innovations, what I would have to say to them is, well, look at the code, and if you find a way for somebody to create new XRP, tell me, and we'll, that'll, we'll urgently fix it. But we believe that we've gone over the code, and there is no way to create XRP. By design, there's no way, and unless there's some kind of bug, it shouldn't be possible. The problem is there's tens of thousands of lines of code you have to look through, and there's other problems than just a transaction creating XRP accounts. Uh, you, know, you could imagine transactions that do other things that are not supposed to happen. Uh, maybe you know they make payments incorrectly or they do other things that are not supposed to happen. So what the XRP ledger does is it executes the transaction in a scratch pad that we call a view. And then it analyzes that view. It's very trivial, just a couple lines of code to say, does this set of changes to the ledger create XRP? You just add up the XRP before the view, add up the XRP after the view, and see if it's higher. What the invariant checker does is if any of those invariants are violated by the view, the view is thrown away. It never gets applied to the live ledger. And a new view is inserted that says this transaction broke a system rule. Now that has never happened, that such an entry has never appeared in the public XRP ledger, but obviously if it ever did, we would know that there was a bug in the code. So unless you found a bug in the invariant checker, which is a very small piece of code compared to the XRP ledger, it's not possible to create XRP because any transaction that does so would just be rejected by the invariant checker. And of course then we would diligently analyze that transaction to find and fix the bug, but at no time would it be able to create XRP in the public ledger. I think that's a critical innovation. Consensus is the way that we advance the ledger, and uh, I want to share a little bit about how we came to that. When I first started working on this, proof of work was believed to be the secret sauce, and it seemed like an intractable problem. It seemed like, you, like there was no way to advance the ledger in ways that people agree upon. And the core problem is the, the double spend problem, that a single person could send the same asset in two different places, and people need to agree on which of those transactions is valid, otherwise you can never rely on a payment. And what we realize is that all you have to do to solve the double spend problem is put transactions in a global order. If there are two transactions that try to send the same asset to two different places, if we agree which one's first, we can agree that the second one is invalid because the asset is no longer the sender's asset. So it just requires global transaction ordering. And it turns out global transaction ordering is not that difficult because transactions are just numbers and numbers are very easy to sort. So we developed a couple of principles, three principles that permit systems to agree on, on global ordering. And one principle is if a transaction has no reason not to be included, all honest nodes will want to include it already. There's, not, there's no problem to solve. All honest system participants will say this transaction has no reason not to be executed in this block. Let's execute it in this block. They'll all sort it the same way because sorting is something that honest people should be able to agree on. It's just putting things in numerical order. If a transaction has any reason not to be included, it's perfectly fine not to include it. Let's say a transaction arrived very late, and maybe some people think it arrived too late to go in this block. Or let's say a transaction is part of a double spend attempt. If someone does a double spend attempt, it's perfectly fine to say to them, we're not going to include your transaction right now because it's part of a double spend problem. So as long as there's any legitimate reason not to include a transaction, it's perfectly fine not to include it. So long as if a valid transaction that doesn't get into the consensus set goes into the next set. So let's say there's a transaction that's submitted 
and someone says, I don't think that transaction was submitted on time. I already decided not to include it in this block. It's perfectly fine for everybody to say, OK, we won't include that transaction in this block. But if it's valid, it definitely goes in the next block. That's fine. So basically, you can say two things. Yes, put this transaction in this block. Or no, put this transaction in the next block if it's valid. There's no way to say, don't ever process this transaction, or throw it away, or execute a double spend. And once all participants agree on a block of transactions, they all sort it the same way, they all execute it the same way, they all get the same result. So it turns out consensus is actually remarkably robust because of these principles. I, I have to say I was surprised at how robust it was. Uh, the XRP ledger is not UTXO based. Um, as some of you probably know, Bitcoin doesn't really think about accounts. It thinks about transactions. Accounts are primary objects on the XRP ledger, and they have balances. This allows some very powerful features that are not possible on ledgers that aren't account-based. My favorite example is key rotation. So let's say you're a charity, and you've published a ledger address for people to send contributions to, and you want to change who has control over that address. In a UTXO-based system like Bitcoin, you need a new address to do that. So you have to tell everybody to send their payments someplace else. On the XRP ledger, you can just change the key that signs for an account. So you can, you know, if you, if you use new infrastructure, you have new employees, you don't trust the old employees, you can just change the key. And you can also set up multi-signature accounts. You can set up multi-signature accounts on Bitcoin, but you can't manage the multi-sign. If one of the signers wants to rotate their key, they can't do it. And that also allowed, allows issued and accepted assets. We had stable coins on the XRP ledger way back in 2012. Accounts can actually issue what are effectively IOUs. If you think about a bank balance, it's effectively an IOU from the bank. The XRP ledger supports a similar concept to allow assets to trade around that are backed in the real world. And the, so the XRP ledger is not just XRP. It also has community credit features where you can allow other accounts to borrow money from you or owe you money. Non-XRP asset balances can exist between accounts, so it can keep track of obligations. Accounts can agree to owe each other funds. And debt settlement can be used as payment. I could spend a lot of time explaining this, but it's a super interesting way to allow, essentially, instead of me borrowing $10 from you and owing you $10, instead you and I exchange IOUs. So I owe you $10 and you owe me $10, and those IOUs can be used as assets to settle other payments. So it's a fascinating tech technology that I would love to see more use of. We integrated the decentralized exchange way back in 2012. You can place offers to trade one asset for another. Payments can take the offers. And it has pathfinding and multipath payments. So what multipath payments mean, if you want to trade dollars for Bitcoin, you don't have to find somebody who wants to trade Bitcoin for dollars. You can, let's say, trade the, bit, the dollars for XRP and the XRP for Bitcoin. And you can actually have a payment that instead of drawing one order book way down and having a, a terrible rate, can draw off multiple order books. It's a fascinating feature that we delivered in 2012. So digital currencies are great. Um, payments are not so great. Can digital currencies fix payments? Well, I think it helps to understand why payments aren't so great. Why is a payment not as simple as an email? Because payment networks are disconnected. Not only is there no universal namespace, there's no universal payment address or pay ID uh, or yet. Uh, like there is for email, but also the networks themselves are disconnected. If I have money in PayPal and I want to get money into Venmo, they're owned by the same company. They don't even interoperate. So there's no universal namespace, and the payment networks are disconnected and don't connect to each other. And as a result, global payments are slow, expensive, and unreliable. And part of why they're expensive is because if you need to use a whole bunch of different disconnected payment systems, you wind up having to leave money in each of those payment systems, which is very costly and inefficient. And any of you who have made international payments know that the reliability level is low. And worse, even when payments are successful, there's frequently no closed loop. So you wind up calling your bank to ask them if the payment succeeded uh, when it actually did succeed. And you just didn't get that information because maybe the recipient didn't tell you. So that, that, that's, not a, that's not a good payment landscape for today's payment demands. Uh, new corporates need hundreds of payment engineers to integrate with multiple payment systems. And they have complex treasury operations to move money between those payment systems. Smaller competitors just can't do that. You know, Amazon, if you're Amazon or Airbnb or Uber, you can have hundreds of payment engineers who make sure that your payments meet your business requirements. But there's no way that, you're, that a small competitor can, can, can build a business that can accept money globally uh, efficiently. They can't get that real-time low-cost settlement. They can't get that good experience. They can't get the, the absence of delays or failures, the things that those customers want. And blockchains don't solve that problem. Blockchains don't talk to existing payment systems. Blockchains don't talk to each other. We've invented a newer version of the interoperability problem with all of our digital assets. And 
I think we kind of got blindsided in the early days of Bitcoin. I think the strategy was everybody used Bitcoin for everything. Bitcoin works with Bitcoin, and so interoperability will be solved. But of course, that's incredibly naive. People have different requirements. They want different things out of payment systems. There isn't going to be one world asset. There isn't going to be one world payment system. And even if there was, you would still you couldn't abandon all of the existing value. You would still need a way for people to get to that new system, and they would have to interoperate with existing systems for some overlap period. Um, as some of you may know, one of the reasons that Cisco was so successful in the internet age was that they supported broad interoperability with technologies that other companies considered ancient. Uh, and, but that was what enabled them to grab a foothold because when the internet is new and gaining market share, interoperability is key. You can't just imagine this future world where everybody uses Bitcoin because uh, you'll never get there without solving the interoperability problem. So digital currencies have to connect to existing value transfer systems, and they have to connect existing value transfer systems, too. Uh, they have to act as a bridge, and they have to be bridged. Uh, that's what we need if we're going to get that internet of value that's our vision. We need banks to talk to blockchains, to talk to mobile money, to talk to online wallets. We need assets that are in common to chains. We need liquidity between the chains. We, we need it. We need, it's, a, it's an effort as big as building the internet, uh, and it's going to solve our payment problems. Now, I want to talk a little bit about interoperability, which is what enables the Internet of Value. If we're, we're not all, again, as I said, we're not all going to be on the same system, but even if we were on the same system, we'd need interoperability to get from where we are to that same system. So you need connections between payment systems that link both payments and assets. There's no way around interoperability. There's no other way to do it. Standardized protocols like Interledger and PayID are efforts in this direction. Again, looking at email. The universal namespace is critical, completely transform what mail is, just works, and then of course the physical interconnections between systems to enable the email to just work. So it is a two-step process. A universal namespace is one thing, but then you also need the connectivity which is requires interoperability protocols to make the namespace just work. Uh, a little update on the effort on PayID, which is a universal namespace for payments, 48 coalition members, over 125 million users. Seven out of the top 10 crypto wallets uh, have joined the coalition. Uh, new members, you can see Coin Payments, Binance Australia, Atomic Wallet, uh, RTM. So that, that effort is moving forward to solve the universal namespace problem. Some new features in, in PayID include verifiable PayID, which allows users to sort of own their PayIDs rather than having them owned by providers, and some additional tools to make development and testing easier to do. I want to talk a little bit about one of the sort of aha moments that led to PayID, which is understanding that email is really two things. It's a universal namespace and it's interconnectivity between different systems that enable that universal namespace to be useful. If you give me your email address, you know, joe at foo.com, and I know that food, I now know that how to tell foo.com your mail, but I have to be connected to foo.com. My email system has to be connected to your email system. There has to be a transfer standard. All of those things have to exist, and it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. And I think what we realized with PayID was that having the universal namespace first enables you to build those interconnections. And so it's an enabling technology to get to that world where, where payments work as easy as email. But it's half the problem. The universal namespace and, and sort of discovery is half the problem. The other ha half of the problem is the interoperability to make the actual funds able to move. So it's, it's a, 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 a critical enabling technology. There'll be benefits immediately. But it's not the end of the, the long-term vision of making payments work like email. It's, it's, a, it's a critical step on that path. I want to talk a little bit about micropayments because I'm a personal believer in them. Um, micropayments are kind of like the difference between packet switching and circuit switching. Maybe I'm dating myself a little bit here, but in the old days, you got a circuit for a phone call. You sort of owned a path from the beginning to the end. That's not how they work anymore. F phone calls are broken into packets and those packets are switched. And I get questions like, well, what good is a micropayment? They're so small. Well, what good is a packet? It's so small. But I'm talking to you now because we have technology that can easily marshal millions of packets. And if one packet goes awry, it doesn't matter because the ends are smart. This is a critical aspect of enabling technology, smart ends in a dumb middle. The internet's pretty dumb. You just put a packet into it and maybe it comes out. It doesn't do anything fancy. It doesn't transform the data. That's good. That means that I'm talking to you now over technologies like Wi-Fi and video streaming that didn't exist when many of the routers were that may be carrying this traffic existed. They'll still work because the middle doesn't have to be smart. All the smarts are at the end. That's what enables the innovation. And uh, smart upper layers and dumb lower layers. 
Wi-Fi doesn't care what data you put over it. I mean, it's not literally dumb, obviously. Wi-Fi goes to extraordinary lengths to provide high throughput and great range, but that's what they should be working on, right? That's what a smart lower layer does. It shouldn't be focused on the stuff, the upper layer. It shouldn't care why we're moving data or what the meaning of that data is. That should be in the upper layers. And the advantage of that is you can build a new upper layer for video streaming that will work over technologies like Ethernet that never had video streaming in mind. That's how you build interoperable networks, and that's what micropayments can do. That's kind of the vision that mostly that Interledger had. And there are interesting things with great micropayments. So you don't need quotes, options, or trust. If I'm going to pay, pay, convert dollars into euros and it's a thousand dollars, I probably want a quote. And quotes create problems. First of all, you have to honor the, you have to expect the party that gave you the quote to honor it. And then there's a sort of free option problem where I might get a quote and only use it if the market moves against you. So you have to give me a quote that protects you against market movements. But if you give me a not very good quote, but you're actually going to give me better service, it's very hard to compare. Right? Like if I call up three companies and I ask them how much something's going to cost me and one says no more than a thousand, one says no more than two thousand, I'll probably go with the one that says no more than a thousand, but the one that said no more than two thousand might actually be cheaper. They might just be more protecting themselves against possible, you know, think unforeseen events. So I can't make an intelligent decision without a hard quote. But if I get a hard quote, you're not going to get like a hard currency exchange quote valid into the future that's very good because the market might move against them. All of those problems go away with micropayments. If I'm moving a thousandth of a penny, I'll just send the thousandth of a penny and see how much comes out the other end. And if I don't like the rate, I just won't use that path again. I'll just use other paths. I can marshal millions of them, and it supports that same innovation above and below. Just like the internet allowed innovation above with like streaming video and, and new protocols, and innovation below like Wi-Fi and cellular technologies that didn't exist when the middle was developed, it separates those layers so that there can be innovation all around. In this case, above would be new protocols for paying, like paying for content, paying for goods, streaming payment to pay for streamed content. And innovation below would mean things like new blockchains and new ledgers. And if we design the system right, we can get that type of separation and innovation. The Interledger protocol is doing micropayments today. There have been over a billion ILP payments to date. In fact, way over a billion. There were a billion uh, as, of, as of the beginning of 2020. The average payment is a tiny fraction of a penny. That's why there are so many of them. But payments can stream. So I can stream money at you as you stream content to me. And I think the first use case for micropayments is definitely going to be paying for content. That's, it, it's just it's a perfect fit, and paying for content works so badly all other ways. The, the usual way we pay for content today is ads, and ads are why companies have to violate my privacy. If you know my age, my gender, and where I live in the world, you can get more money for the ads that you show me, and that gives you the reason to violate my privacy. So it's a problem that's really worth solving, and micropayments are solving that problem today. So those are the pieces. We need digital assets. We need interoperability, uh, maybe micropayments to get that internet of value, that world where a payment works uh, as easily as an email. We need a lot of more research. This is a nascent field. A lot of the things I'm talking about are theoretical. Some of the things are here today and some of the things I'm confident we can build in the future. But in that visionary stage where you're looking at the Model T and you're just starting to see that diversification, um, we need quantum resistant cryptography. We know quantum computing is going to be here eventually, and it breaks a lot of the cryptography that we have. There are quantum resistant signature algorithms that we could use today, but they're not good for blockchain, and being forced to use them would really suck. So we need breakthroughs in quantum resistant cryptography and algorithms that work for blockchains. Zero knowledge proofs are a brand new cryptographic primitive, incredibly exciting area. Um, we, need, we, we need to figure out what they're good for and how to use them, and we need more technological breakthroughs in improving their performance and compacting their size. It's a fascinating area of research. Governance is an interesting area, too. How do you govern a system that works only by the continuous agreement of its participants? They're very much like governments and much less like corporations, and almost literally everything else. I mean, this is a nascent field. Uh, we, we don't know what we're doing yet. We barely know how to do anything. I, I, we need innovation. I, I've, ta I've talked about trustless bridges that will connect blockchains to each other so assets can interoperate. There's, we got to figure out what problems DeFi can solve. We have these DeFi technologies and we're not really sure what can people actually use them for? Where is their product market fit? What can we use blockchains for beyond money? Uh, and again, almost literally everything else, whether it's computer science, 
whether it's whether it's history, whether it's economics, whether it's distributed systems, but also the governance problems, the sociology type problems. How we, can we change? Can we change the world? Can we really make a dent in global finance? I think we can, but we are just very early, and we need everything. And that's why this is such an exciting space to be in. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, David, for that, uh, that great talk. Um, lots of exciting stuff going on. Um, we're very excited at BitPay uh, about PayID in particular, and we're gonna doing the work necessary to adopt that in our wallet and our platform uh, as we speak. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about uh, payments on a blockchain more broadly and, 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 and in general. And uh, so I'm Stephen Pear. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called BitPay. Uh, we were formed in, in 2011, so we're coming up on our 10-year anniversary next year. And uh, what we do as a company is enable people to manage payments on a blockchain. So we provide all the tooling that one might need for e-commerce payments, invoicing, and et cetera, uh, on our platform. And we help companies and individuals manage the full life cycle of a payment. And there's a, a lot of aspects of a payment that people often overlook. Things like, how do you manage a refund? How do you manage currency conversion in the middle of that? And so that's really what we're here to do is to help those companies manage their blockchain payments. So our vision at BitPay is that all payments or most payments in the future will be done on a blockchain. And really the reason we believe that is because blockchain itself is a new kind of database. If you compare it to old kind of databases where we have this repository of information that we try to protect through boundary defenses and make sure the wrong people can't access it, um, that's a very old school way and very um, insecure way of, of operating a database. With a blockchain database, rather than create boundary defenses to prevent bad actors from getting in, the database is open to the world and anybody is free uh, to mutate the state or modify that database as long as they follow the rules set forth for that that blockchain so in the example of uh, you know for it, with, with Bitcoin for example the world's oldest blockchain as long as you create a transaction that has you know, no more Bitcoin coming out of that transaction than were put into that transaction, then, uh, and then it's properly cryptographically signed, and there are some other rules that go along with that, then you can create that transaction and you can broadcast it on the network, and then it will get incorporated into the history of that database. This is transformational, and, and we at BitPay actually think that blockchain as a database, as a database technology, will become in the future the, the dominant form of databases that people use. Um, so payments is one use case, um, but there are many use cases that blockchain can address. So it's that fundamental belief about blockchain as a database technology and its adoption, not just for payments, but all kinds of use cases um, that makes us believe that in the future, most payments are gonna be done on a blockchain. And our mission at BitPay is to build the best platform for companies and individuals to manage those payments and stay laser focused on that. So when we think about how blockchains are transforming payments, we can point to things like it's a fun, it's a digital transaction first and foremost. So we move out of the physical realm into the realm of cyberspace. Uh, it's convenient, it's ubiquitous, so it works anywhere you have internet access. Um, and then it's safe and secure. And in fact, the, with, if you look at the Bitcoin blockchain, the oldest blockchain, uh, it's a database whose integrity has never been compromised in the entire history of, of that database. And uh, this despite it being open to the world. Um, so that's really profound when you think about it. So the first use case that we like to talk about is sort of BitPay's bread and butter and what we started out originally focusing on back in 2011 which were consumer payments. So you can imagine this might be somebody 
you know, buying a computer from Newegg, who was one of our merchants. Um, Bob, Bob can be, you know, uh, sitting anywhere in the world that he has internet access, go to Newegg's website, choose the option to pay with cryptocurrency. And we do support many cryptocurrencies, including XRP on the BitPay platform, uh, and make that payment happen. And Newegg receives that payment. Um, and we, it's a very low cost transaction. It's immediate. Um, and there's no risk of fraud or chargebacks or very low risk of fraud. Um, when you compare that with a traditional credit card payment, if it's an international transaction, about one in 50 of those are fraudulent and the merchant has to pay the cost of that. But that's one example of how a consumer might use blockchain payments. Um, but there are many other uh, capabilities that we provide and, and, and ways that we give a consumer the ability to tap into their wealth that's stored on a blockchain, whether it's Bitcoin, XRP, or any of the other ones that we support. So you might buy a computer from Newegg, but another thing you can do is you can um, you know, get the BitPay MasterCard uh, and shop anywhere Ma MasterCard is accepted. And with a single click of a button, convert your XRP or Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash or Ethereum or uh, several others, including US dollar tokens, stable coins. You can convert that into a dollar balance on that MasterCard and then spend it wherever MasterCard is accepted. Now, hopefully, eventually, everywhere you want to spend it uh, will eventually natively support a crypto payment. But we know right now, today, there are many businesses that don't yet uh, support crypto payments. Another thing you can do is buy gift cards on the platform. And this, you know, is just yet another convenient way for a consumer to tap into the wealth that they've, you know, accumulated in cryptocurrency. And when you think about that, you look at all the blockchains, you can go to coin, uh, coinmarket coin, coinmarketcap.com and you can look at all the top cryptocurrencies. And there's hundreds of billions of dollars that are stored in these blockchains. And as a company, we want to give those users very convenient means of tapping into that wealth and accessing that wealth. Uh, another thing that consumers might be interested in is getting paid in crypto. So one of the, while BitPay is primarily known for our merchant uh, services um, and our invoicing and billing, we also go the opposite direction. We allow companies to be able to disperse payments so they can send us a traditional fiat payment you know, using a traditional bank transfer and then tell us, okay, I want to pay all these people around the world in, you know, whatever cryptocurrency and we will manage that whole process for them. Uh, so some use cases for that are affiliate programs where, you know, you have a company that needs to pay a lot of people around the world and they need just a convenient place to do that. Another uh, example might be uh, your payroll. So a payroll company might use that to give employees to take a portion of their paycheck in crypto. So those are some of the examples of how a consumer might, you know, it could benefit, can benefit from crypto payments. And by the way, I should stop since we're, you know, talking about Ripple and XRP. Um, I will say that XRP is really one of our favorite uh, payment platforms. Um, and I say that because, you know, since we've launched it, it's been, you know, a very straightforward, very seamless, uh, you know, process from a, a backend perspective. So, you know, XRP transactions tend to go through, they get confirmed very quickly. And we've just generally had very little issues, very few issues with that blockchain. So I think XRP and the XRP blockchain is, is a really great blockchain for payments. And uh, um, I just wanted to mention that since we're at a Ripple conference, but it's, it's, it's true. I mean, I think if you ask anybody working on the software at BitPay, um, we've been very pleasantly, and I would say pleasantly surprised with how straightforward, simple, and easy it's been, and how it really just works for that payment use case. All right, so the next thing I wanted to move on to are you know, business payments. In some ways, you know, the consumer payments, um, you know, really there we're talking about attracting and, and giving tools to that early crypto adopter that has some uh, cryptocurrency in their wallet 
uh, and they just want a convenient way to spend it without sending it to an exchange, without cashing it out, having to withdraw to a bank account and you know use the legacy methods of payment. We would rather they just simply spend that currency directly. And as a company, we want to en enable that and, and just make that a very easy process for the consumer. Um, but in some ways, even more compelling are the B2B or, or business payments. Um, so think of an example like, you know, a small company in Brazil, you know, paying to, you know, another business uh, located in South Korea. Um, if you look at the traditional ways to make that payment, you're often talking about, well, if you talk about a really, really traditional way, that Brazilian company might write a check and put it in the mail or FedEx it over to, you know, that South Korean business. Now, the business sitting in South Korea has to look at that check and say, hmm, you know, that's a check drawn on a bank in Brazil, not in South Korea. So how are they going to actually get that over into their bank account? Um, and usually that method actually won't work. But, um, but if you talk about an electronic payment, such as a wire transfer, wire transfers use something called the correspondent banking system. And which means that there may be a small bank in Brazil that needs to connect into a bigger bank in Brazil that has ties into the Forex markets that can then uh, have a correspondent bank located in South Korea. And they kind of have some trust between one another. And then that, that bank in South Korea might have a relationship with uh, ultimately the bank that the business in South Korea uses. And so you got like four banks involved in that transaction. There's a lot of trust in that, that between those banks that has to be in place for that transaction to be able to go through. And they're each going to charge a fee. Um, and it's going to take a while. And usually when you send a wire transfer like that, you don't actually know when it's going to arrive and you don't even know how much you're going to end up paying for it. So it's really an antiquated system. If you look at a crypto transaction, when I transfer XRP from one person to another or from one business to another, it's a digital asset that has a market value. And that possession, that ownership, that custody of that uh, asset transfers immediately, like sending an email. And really, you know, when Bitcoin was created back in 2011, that was the first time we had anything like that, any capability even remotely like that. I have a digital asset. I like to think of, you know, Bitcoin and XRP as digital commodities. And that, that asset, can be transferred from one person or business to another person or business across the world, wherever there's internet access, and it has a market value in both places. So the receiving company, it eliminates a huge amount of risk for the company receiving that payment because they don't, they're not getting a check in the mail and they're not waiting on some wire transfer. Um, they instantly get the asset and it has a market value. And if they choose to, they can go sell it in their uh, local market and convert it into their local currency if they choose to do that. And many companies, in fact, do want to do that, both on the paying end and the receiving end, because their accounting systems are based in their local currency. And it eliminates a lot of accounting complexity um, if they can just transact and make the, do their purchasing in that uh, you know, native currency or that local currency. Now, most businesses, you, you might be surprised to find that most businesses still use paper checks to pay each other. In fact, uh, a, a recent study um, conducted last year showed that about 80% of businesses still use paper checks uh, to pay each other. Um, and only 15% use wire or ACH to do that. So there's still a tremendous opportunity, untapped market potential, um, almost untapped market potential to really bring those businesses into the modern era and give them tools that allow them to uh, transact much more efficiently, much more safely. So um, I mentioned sort of payroll and disbursements. Um, a couple other examples are, you know, companies like Airbnb and Uber paying their hosts and drivers around the world. Um, so you're talking about companies that have a very broad and very large workforce um, of really contract workers and uh, using crypt, uh, crypto, uh, cryptocurrency to make those payments happen. And whether you're talking about Bitcoin, XRP, or stable coins built, uh, you know, for uh, or tied to the local currency, 
um, it's just easier, right? It, uh, it's just easier for a company to tie into an API that BitPay can provide them, uh, and they can just push those payments out and manage that whole process. Um, again, a lot of the, you know, you can, you know, physically execute these payments on the on the blockchain, but BitPay's uh, business model here is really to, um, you know, make that whole workflow easy on the company and really assist them in, in managing that. So you can imagine if you're having to pay, you know, a thousand different people uh, and disperse that all over the world, having one API that you can tie into and just manage that whole list of recipients and make sure that all the payments go through, that any that um, go to a wrong address or whatnot, you have ways to uh, deal with that. So that's really what we talk about when we mean the, the entire workflow of a payment. Um, so, you know, just to kind of summarize, uh, crypto payments really eliminate friction. Um, and in fact, if you use, uh, you know, our tools, we like to think, if you use our tools to manage those payments, it's really easy. Um, uh, many people have not actually used a crypto payment or conducted a crypto payment. And, um, and they sort of assume that there's this complexity. And with a lot of tools there are, and when you talk about, you know, you know using a, a different wallet from, you know, the payment pr provider from the exchange, there's a lot to wrap your head around and it can be intimidating for the new user. And a lot of the companies in the space were really working hard to try and make it more approachable and, and easier to use. But I can honestly say that once you've actually got kind of gotten over the hurdle of, you know, setting up a wallet and acquiring your first cryptocurrency, when it actually comes down to making that payment, it's extraordinarily simple. Um, you know, one, one of our customers, uh, AT&T, you can actually go and pay your cell phone bill, your direct TV bill, um, your internet bill, right from their website. You choose BitPay as a payment option. Uh, an invoice pops up, you choose which cryptocurrency you want to pay in, um, and then you scan it with your wallet and you click a button and you're done. It's really that simple. So, uh, so obviously we're bullish on payments. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is just sort of how we look at that new user into the, uh, to the space. Somebody who has really never used crypto, cryptocurrency at all. You know, they usually are starting out by hearing about you know, the price of this or that uh, crypto, and um, they really want to make an investment. They're interested in, you know, the gains that they see people uh, making from those investments. And that's usually the, the starting point. And so what do they do? They go sign up for an exchange account and they buy their first cryptocurrency, but they're storing it on the exchange. So we kind of consider this the sort of fear of missing out user, the, the, the user that just wants some exposure to the to the asset for financial gains. Um, once they have that and they actually have uh, gotten interested in it, uh, then usually they want to take the next step. And this is usually where they decide, okay, leaving assets with accounts on exchanges or other services is not necessarily the best way to store your crypto. Um, so in the community, a lot of people talk about not your keys, not your coins, right? Uh, and they're really trying to encourage people to take possession of their uh, cryptocurrency. So for that, you need a wallet where, you know, you can actually withdraw from the exchange or wherever you have an, a, a crypto balance, withdraw it out of that account and put it into a wallet where you control the keys. And this is really where we're focusing our efforts is once that user wants that wallet and to be able to secure their own crypto, we want to build tools that help them do that the right way, help them do, do that safely and securely, um, and really start to own their own crypto. Now, so that's the, that's the not your keys, not your coins phase. Now, the third phase is when people actually want to start to transact. And that's usually when uh, they have seen some gains, you know, and they do have some wealth now accumulated in that wallet. Now, everybody talks about you know, that's sort of the Lambo meme. Um, now, not all of us are gonna be so fortunate that we make that much money on crypto, but uh, 
Um, but we actually call that third phase sort of the, the Lambo phase. And uh, just kind of a funny, uh, funny little thing that, uh, you know, we like to talk about. But, um, but it's really the phase where you want to start buying stuff. And so um, this is really where you've gotten to the point where people are now starting to conduct commerce with cryptocurrency. And so, um, again, we want to, uh, we're focused on that phase as well. So really giving people the tools to own their own crypto and then to enable them to spend it um, once they're ready to do that. And so, uh, you know, that's really it to summarize. I think, uh, you know, we're really excited about some of the, you know, partnering with Ripple. Uh, we're very excited about PayID. We think that'll solve a really important pain point, which is dealing with these low level addresses and wallets. So you can look forward to BitPay uh, adding support for that in the very near future. And um, yeah, we're looking, uh, looking forward to doing a lot of great things related to crypto payments and partnering with Ripple um, uh, to do that. And I, there are great speakers coming up that I hope you'll stick around for. Uh, and I also hear that there's some great announcements coming from RippleX. Um, so you'll want to stay tuned for that. I'm Joey Krug, I'm co-CIO of Pantera Capital and one of the co-founders at Augur. And I'm going to give a talk on decentralized finance and sort of how I see the space, where I see it going, and um, you know, what sort of interesting things and investments we're making in the space as well. So the main way I think about DeFi is sort of as this new financial infrastructure. It's really the underpinnings of a new financial infrastructure. If you think about the internet, the internet was the underpinnings of a new information infrastructure. Um, the internet did kind of two things that was different than the information revolutions prior. Um, one is that it revolutionized access to information, but two is that it also democratized creation of content. So if you look at, you know, radio, television, etc., the form factor was different, but for the most part, not very many people are on the radio, not very many people are on TV, but with the internet, the thing that was different is that anybody could really go out there and create a website or post a tweet or even, you know, something as mundane as post a picture of, you know, what you had for dinner last night on Instagram. And, you know, if you told somebody 30 years ago that people would post pictures of the food that they had for dinner and their friends would comment on it and like it and, and kind of discuss it, that would have been viewed as really wacky and really crazy. So I'm sort of asking you to suspend your disbelief for a moment and envision what's the wacky, crazy thing like that, but for finance, you know, what, what could actually happen here? And my belief is that similar things will happen for financial markets. People will basically create and use kind of new bespoke financial products on the fly. Um, I don't think this will be that uncommon in the future. And so if you look at how the internet revolutionized information, I think blockchain tech is going to be the same thing for finance, particularly surrounding opening access to and enabling the creation of of new financial instruments, contracts, and agreements. And so if you think about a financial system, the way we think about crypto is it's sort of this parallel financial system. Um, you have the old one that still exists, and for a long time, you'll need to be able to get money back and forth between the two. And if you look at kind of what makes up a financial system, you know, I believe there's really five key components. Um, there's the unit of account, so this is, in, in plain English, it's, you know, what currency are you trading in? Um, for most people, that's dollars. Uh, you know, if you're in Europe, maybe you're trading in euros. Uh, but there's only a handful of currencies that are really used for global trade. Um, and in the blockchain space, you know, while I'm sure a lot of people would love for, for Bitcoin to be this kind of global currency that everyone uses, I mean, I think that would be cool too. It's, it's quite unlikely for a very long time. And so you need things that are dollar pegged assets. And so this is where stable coins come in, uh, things like USDC, things like DAI. Uh, there's a bunch of different variants of stable coins, but the punchline is they enable you to have effectively dollars on the blockchain. So that's one kind of key primitive. Um, the next one that's really important is decentralized exchanges. So the concept of how do you trade these assets without an intermediary? You know, one of the big benefits of blockchain tech is cutting down on the amount of middlemen um, and kind of removing unnecessary 
uh, people who siphon a piece of every transaction. And so with exchanges, that's, that's kind of another component. Decentralized exchanges allow trading of these assets with no intermediary. Right now, it's primarily just cryptocurrencies. But long term, you can envision people trading a wide array of assets. You can envision, you know, tokenized securities on the blockchain. Uh, you can envision people trading, you know, fractional pieces of real estate. Um, it's, that's another key component. The last three components are, um, you know, they're not strictly necessary, but a financial system doesn't really work too well without them. And so these are um, lending, margin, and leverage. So most financial systems have some sort of lending component. Um, you know, in the traditional financial system, uh, it's things like corporate debt, individuals have credit cards, uh, there's various ways to get access to credit. Uh, in cryptocurrency, we finally started to see the first of these protocols come out, things like Compound, uh, protocols like Aave. Uh, these are protocols that enable you to basically borrow against your cryptocurrency. There's also companies that do this. Uh, BlockFi is an example of a company where they let you borrow against your Bitcoin and Ether. Um, they also let you lend them out and, and earn an interest rate on that accordingly. Um, the last two pieces are, are margin and leverage. These are much harder to do, decentralized. There's a lot of risk. You know, you basically have something where it's not fully backed by a dollar. Um, you know, you're, you're basically effectively taking a bet when you're opening a margin position and you can get liquidated. Um, and especially when blockchain tech isn't super scalable yet today, um, those are kind of harder components to create, but people are making them. And so the kind of last thing I'll touch on before kind of moving on to like barriers to adoption is, is liquidity. So if you have this new financial system, it sounds really exciting, it sounds really neat, but any financial system is useless without underlying liquidity. Any of these markets need to be fair. Uh, it's really important that they're fair to trade in. And it needs to be relatively easy, cheap, and fast to participate in them as well. Um, and those tend to be a lot of the benefits of blockchain tech, especially uh, once some of the barriers, which I'll mention uh, in the next slide, get eliminated. And so right now, you know, blockchain-based financial markets are relatively small. They've been growing very quickly. If you look at the decentralized finance space, there's about 12 billion or so dollars in capital kind of locked up participating in these protocols. And uh, I think that's gonna continue to increase. Um, and it's kind of a testament to how exciting the tech is that that many people are using it, even when it's you know, really not too cheap or fast to, to participate yet. And so that kind of comes to like, what are the barriers to preventing this from becoming something really big, something that people even outside of the cryptocurrency space will be excited about. It's something that really does transform uh, how finance works. And I think there's really three main barriers. Um, one is infrastructure. There's a lot of R&D going into this, um, like from a ton of different companies. Um, and right now the infrastructure is pretty difficult to use, um, especially comparative to the traditional web stack. So if you look at something like, um, you know, building in JavaScript, that's quite easy to use. Um, it's pretty easy for a developer to kind of pull something off the shelf and start building. Five years ago, that was almost impossible in the blockchain space. Now it's much more possible. It's not easy, but it's getting there. And I think, you know, within another five years, it'll be really easy to build on. Uh, the next two are fiat and crypto on-ramps. Uh, so this is something that, you know, a lot of uh, the work Ripple does actually intersects with this, is, you know, how do you get uh, people into cryptocurrency, um, <clears throat> you know, whether that's an institution, whether that's an individual user, uh, you basically need to kind of <clears throat> bridge the existing financial system with the new uh, blockchain based one. And then maybe, you know, <clears throat> 20 or 30 years from now, we're sitting here and everything is blockchain based. Um, but there's gonna be that bridge period uh, in between. And then the last one is scalability. Uh, to support kind of these global financial applications, you need blockchains that are quite scalable, that do lots of transactions per second, um, and that have also relatively low latency. You know, most users are not comfortable waiting 30 seconds to a minute for something to happen. Uh, people are just, you know, fairly impatient these days. And so you know, they want something that's much more instant. Um, this is kind of a high level overview of what different projects there are in the decentralized finance space. Um, Kind of starting at the top, you have these aggregators that basically take a bunch of different use cases and let you access them in kind of one simple to understand UI. Um, it's an example of this is something like InstaDAP. It's a UI that basically lets you 
interface with all these DeFi applications and smart contracts and stuff. And it's sort of like a, you could almost sort of think of it like your blockchain based bank, except you own your money, you custody your funds. Um, it's kind of entirely, entirely peer to peer. Um, and there's no like middle menu, you just custody your money. Uh, the next ones are lots of things we already talked about, things like lending, where you have MakerDAO and Compound, decentralized exchanges, things like 0x, Uniswap, um, you know, things like oracles is an interesting problem in DeFi. How do you get data about the real world into the blockchain? Uh, that's useful for various financial contracts uh, where you kind of need data about something that happened um, in the external world. How do you get that securely without kind of just trusting one person? And then the last two big categories are like marketplaces and you know, stable coins and payments. Um, so things like, things like Terra, things like um, Flexa that are kind of focused on the payment side and then decentralized marketplaces that, you know, they're not like DeFi apps per se in the sense that they're known on like trading or financial apps, but they inherently involve transacting with multiple parties on multi-sided marketplaces. An example of that is something like Filecoin, which is a marketplace for file storage or something like Origin, which is a sort of sharing economy protocol where you can access, you know, things like decentralized versions of Airbnb. And so now I'm gonna kind of walk through in specific detail some of these projects. Um, and then at the end, we'll kind of walk through some of these projects that are more specifically focused on payments, remittances, exchanges, that sort of stuff. And then at the very end of the presentation, I'll just walk through kind of the growth that the DeFi space has seen. Um, but I think it's, it's really important. It's been something I've been super passionate about for like six or seven years now at this point. And um, it's finally starting to take off. And there was a long period where the growth just felt like a flat line, but it's, it's finally growing quite rapidly. Um, but I think it's kind of important to understand what are these interesting protocols that people have created? What do they let you do from a very practical sense? Um, so the first one I wanted to walk through is Maker. And so what Maker does, it's a, it's a borrowing and lending protocol. It lets you basically give it Ether or some other cryptocurrencies and borrow against it. And when you borrow, they give you a new cryptocurrency, actually, it's called DAI. It's a stable coin that's pegged uh, to the US dollar. So basically you deposit, say you deposit $1,000 of Ether and you borrow, say, $300 of DAI. You start accruing interest on that. Eventually you have to pay the DAI back. And the idea is that this DAI stable coin is effectively backed um, by the collateral in Maker. And so it's sort of like a debt issued currency almost. And um, that's a very kind of powerful notion. It's sort of the first project of its kind. Uh, they were developing it for a very long time since like, I think late 2014, or early 2015. Uh, it finally launched in, I believe, late 2017, early 2018. Um, that's sort of like one of the first big uh, DeFi projects. Um, the next one that I wanted to mention that's somewhat similar is called Compound. Um, and this lets you borrow and lend crypto assets, again, without any middlemen. The difference is it doesn't produce a stable coin as a byproduct. It's just a pure, <clears throat> basically money market uh, borrowing and lending system. Uh, the next category is decentralized exchanges. So here you really have one kind of big front runner and then you have a bunch of people competing with them. And then you have some other alternative approaches that I think are interesting and I think long run uh, are kind of more likely to, to win out in the long run. So the big front runner is Uniswap. Uh, most people in the cryptocurrency space have heard of them. Um, what most people don't know is that it's an idea that's actually quite old. Um, there are a couple of folks who kind of tossed around this idea for what if you could trade cryptocurrencies where there's actually no like order book, there's no market maker explicitly on the other side. You instead just kind of throw funds into this smart contract and it basically automatically trades um, and it automatically provides liquidity using an equation. And um, it's actually kind of a really old idea actually borrowed from the prediction market space. Um, where people have been using these equations for a long time. And I think a guy named Alan Liu, and also Vitalik proposed it at one point, basically proposed what if you applied this to just regular trading? Um, and that's sort of kind of the genesis behind uh, Uniswap. The next one is, is 0x. And 0x is a decentralized exchange that uses an order book model. Now, they don't have nearly as much traction as Uniswap for the reason that Order books are just not an effective way of trading uh, on blockchain today because of the cost, 
speed and latency issues. Um, and so zero bucks does actually offer in many cases actually better pricing, but it's typically more expensive to trade uh, if you're kind of doing a lot of active trading. Um, and I think once kind of layer two systems exist, I think in practice, what's going to happen is zero X is going to get a lot more popular. I think their growth is going to really pop off once you can do these trades for, you know, under a second and it costs, you know, one or two cents to do it. Uh, but right now the kind of Uniswap model is much easier to understand and it's simpler and it kind of works in an environment where transaction costs are quite expensive. Uh, next you have payments um, that are kind of the more DeFi payments. And then later we'll walk through kind of the more centralized finance payments that reduce the gap between these two ecosystems. Um, on the DeFi side, there's a company called Terra. It's basically a blockchain payments network, um, its own blockchain, and they power a bunch of payments in Korea. Um, and what's interesting about it is it, it also issues a stablecoin as a byproduct. So they're basically taking um, this kind of new system that they designed, it issues a stablecoin as a byproduct, and they're using it to process payments for a bunch of merchants um, in Korea. Uh, the next one is Flexa. This is a kind of a bit different. It's more processing payment in the United States and it uses cryptocurrencies that already exist. So whether you have something like USDC, DAI, Ether, Ripple, Bitcoin, whatever it is, you could use it uh, through the spend app um, to basically pay for things in kind of physical retail locations across the US and Canada. Um, Aggregators. So one other thing to mention on the aggregator side, I walked through Instadap earlier. The other one that's really interesting is called Yearn or Yearn Finance. Um, it's basically a portal to various DeFi projects. And it effectively what you do is you give them your money. So say you have USDC or say you have DAI or say you have Ether, you'll give it to Yearn and it will sort of automatically manage it to earn you as much yield as possible. And then uh, they'll basically pay you the profits minus, I think, like a 0.5% fee. And uh, maybe it's 1% fee nowadays. And uh, it's, it's really unique because any developer can go out there and write one of these new strategies for basically optimizing uh, the assets that you give it. Uh, it's sort of like the world's kind of first on-chain autonomous uh, cryptocurrency hedge fund. And there's about three quarters of a billion dollars in value locked up in, in this vehicle, uh, which is kind of really interesting and exciting and, and powerful. And uh, I think it's actually kind of a huge moment in finance that something like this is even possible to exist. Um, on scalability, you know, you mentioned how there's a lot of barriers to scalability, how it's really hard to scale in the space. Um, there's a bunch of different approaches to this. Some people are building things called layer twos on Ethereum to basically make it really easy uh, to deploy your DAP onto it and um, kind of run it in a more scalable fashion. There's also other blockchains trying to do this. Um, one example, this is Polkadot. It's founded by a guy who used to be the CTO of Ethereum, Gavin Wood. And uh, they actually launched a mainnet already. Uh, the downside of Polkadot though, is that it's, it's quite hard to deploy existing Solidity contracts, the programming language on Ethereum into Polkadot. Um, they're working on making that a lot easier, but they, it's not quite there yet. Um, and then the last thing in scalability is Ethereum itself is working on ETH 2.0, which is supposed to be this kind of massively scalable um, new version of Ethereum. Uh, and the first part of that is supposed to launch sometime in the next few months. Um, and then kind of lastly, on the more kind of centralized bridges between DeFi and decentralized finance, uh, the two examples I wanted to highlight are, are Coimi and Bitso. Um, and so these are kind of like really actually quite used in the real world. Um, and uh, what Coinme is, it's a platform that basically is software that runs on these Bitcoin ATMs and kiosks located in places like grocery stores where people can basically very easily convert their cash uh, into crypto. Um, and it's growing really fast. It's actually quite, quite popular. Um, and there's not really any other good kind of cash on ramps. There's a lot of on ramps that assume you have a bank account um, they kind of assume you have access to the banking system and those work great for people that do, but if you don't, or if you just want to buy a hundred dollars in Bitcoin, you don't want to wait, you know, three or four days, uh, you can use something like Coinme to do that. Uh, the next one is, is Bitso. And Bitso is really interesting. Um, 
because it's basically a, a Latin American based cryptocurrency exchange and they power, you know, roughly 7% of the US Mexico remittance corridor. Um, I remember getting in when I got into crypto, you know, a long time ago, one of the things people always said is, oh, Bitcoin is going to be used for remittances. Um, and, and for quite a long time, it didn't really happen too much. But now it's actually happening. Uh, like this is a real use case. Um, people are using it for remittances. And that's really exciting uh, to kind of finally see something like that. That's pretty practical out there in the real world. And so I just wanted to walk through those examples uh, to sort of give people kind of an overview of the DeFi space, um, sort of how we see it, what, what sort of interesting projects there are in there. Uh, some of those things were investors in at Pantera, some of them were not. Um, I just wanted to kind of pick some select examples that are sort of market leaders in sort of the various uh, kind of subsectors of DeFi. Um, the very kind of last thing I wanted to go over before wrapping up my talk is growth in open finance and or decentralized finance. And there's really two metrics that you can look at. Um, one is kind of total value locked or this concept of how much dollars, how many dollars are locked up in DeFi applications. Um, so one of the kind of core thesis is, is that, you know, DeFi is going to be a main driver of value to the space. Um, what does that look like empirically? Well, it's happening. Uh, in January 2018, there was only, you know, 100 or 200 million or so locked up in DeFi apps. January 2019, you know, you're starting to get up to like 300 million or so kind of ballpark. January 2020, about a billion dollars. And then now we're sitting here in, you know, October now. Uh, 2020, and it's around 11 to 12 billion dollars right now. Um, so it's growing very fast, very small in comparison to traditional finance. You know, you have companies like BlackRock that have, I think, over a trillion under management. Um, but you know, only two years ago, it was like 100 million. So it's grown super, super quickly, and I think it's, that pace is going to continue for quite some time. And the last metric is decentralized exchange volume growth. Um, What's cool about these metrics is they're very easy to track. If you ever want to check in, see kind of how DeFi doing, you can track the PVL metric on DeFi Pulse. Uh, for the other metric, decentralized exchange volume growth, uh, you can look that up a few different places. Um, the source I'm citing is one that's called Dune Analytics. You can look it up for specific DEXs on CoinMarketCap as well. Uh, but the punchline is the volume to that has been soaring as well. Um, in January 2019, it was so small, it's, it's a blip. Um, you know, it, it basically rounds down to zero. Uh, January 2020, you know, you're looking at a couple hundred million a month. Um, September 2020, uh, volumes hit 22 billion. So it's now starting to become, you know, definitely not as big as centralized exchanges, but the market share is no longer meaningless. It's actually starting to become a meaningful, meaningful number. And so that's sort of how, how we see the DeFi space. Um, I think it's going to be the next sort of big growth area for cryptocurrencies. Um, and I think if you look at, you know, the question, like, how can this tech impact the world as much as the internet impacted the world? I think it has to be through decentralized finance and companies that either assist that or help power it. Um, digital gold is really cool. I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin. But I think if you look back, you know, if you look back on this tech 30 years from now, um, I think the answer is going to be is decentralized finance is what actually um, made the kind of huge zero to one shift in society. Thanks everyone. I hope you learned something useful. Next up is some partner demos with PayID. And later I've heard that there's a grant program with Ripple X, uh, which you should definitely check out, especially if you're a developer working on you know, something innovative. Um, hey, everybody. My name is Sean Rowland. I um, wanted to thank the keynotes we just watched. That is some really exciting stuff happening in the crypto industry. Um, and to show a little bit more of the practical application, um, what we at BitPay plan to be having um, in, our, in our app, the BitPay app, um, is a little demonstration of Pay ID. Um, so I lead the product management and the product design teams at BitPay. Um, BitPay is the largest global payment processor in the world. We process payments for companies like AT&T and Newegg, um, and we also have a non-custodial um, BitPay app 
um, and as well as a debit card in the US that you can attach to that app. Um, but what we're going to be showing today is pay ID in our non custodial app and sending and discovering and verifying someone else's pay ID. Um, so we'll go ahead and and get into that. Um, but one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit first is why BitPay decided to join um, the pay ID and take part in this protocol and kind of building it out in our in own ecosystem. Um, it solves a lot of problems um, currently and in the future um, where we're seeing payments go. You know, one of the, the key issues that addresses um, in the crypto space is, hey, I've got these really funky addresses. I've got to save it and remember my friend Marty or my, you know, sister Jenny. Um, I've got, oh, this is her crypto address. I need to send it. Even if she shares it to me, then I might mistype it, et cetera. A lot of, a lot of ways to mess that up. Um, and pay ID is a really nice way to kind of have like a permanent web of trust address book, um, you know, that all my different peers and eventually merchants, um, I can really use this as an overall um, value transfer mechanism without having to remember someone's Venmo account and someone's BCH and someone's BTC address or someone's XRP address. Um, so again, a lot of really good things um, that it solves now, um, pay ID does, as well as in the future. Um, so I'll go ahead and show that demo um, and start kind of kind of talking through a little bit of that. Okay, so right here, this is in the BitPay app. Um, you can go to iOS or Android to download it. And this is once you have created a wallet and you've added funds to it. In this wallet, there's Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, ETH, XRP. Um, and I've clicked into uh, one wallet. And again, this is one master key um, that controls all these different individual currencies. So I want to send. I want to send from um, one of these wallets. And what also goes, shows you, oh, I've got these contacts. Like, who do I want to send this to? And you notice it's not like it shows addresses or for XRP or for ETH that's showing me in these cases, um, you know, here's some great pay IDs that my, I might want to pay to. But in this example, I'll say, hey, I, you know, I've got my friend Marty. It's the first time we're sharing pay IDs. I want to make sure he is him and he has control of the, the addresses behind pay ID. Um, so I'm going to also verify him. So I'm going to go ahead and say, all right, Marty, what's your pay ID? Um, and he's going to tell me, hey, it's Marty uh, dollar sign savant dot com. I'm like, I, cool, cool. I type that in. The BitPay app then searches it across the entire pay ID protocol. Um, and then what happens, I'm like, oh, hey, Marty, you're not verified. Like, and I'm imagine I'm on the phone with him and I'm like, hey, you know, I want to make sure this is you. This is the Marty. You control this pay ID. Will you go ahead and verify your pay ID? And so what he has on his app um, is what he'll pull up like, you know, verification process. And he'll read off these set of numbers to me. Um, and if he reads off a different set of numbers, um, that means that, hey, this is the wrong Marty dollar sign savant.com. I need to research. I, I need to, I maybe typed it in wrong. But if he reads these exact same numbers off to me, um, this is kind of some back end encryption. If you're familiar with PGP, some similar concepts there. Um, this is how I'm going to verify 100% that Marty right now on the phone controls that pay ID. Um, and I'm going to be sending money to that, to Marty. Um, so I'm like, great. You're verified. So what that does, cool. All right, he's verified. And what's going to happen is BitPay, we automatically add that to your contacts and as a verified contact. Because what we really want to be happening is a web of trust being built up. Oh, I see. Eventually, like, you know, my sister Jenny can see that I trust Marty and that can help her then trust Marty also. Um, but really building up a big address book of verified contacts um, that I can send payments to without worrying about um, sending to the wrong address or the wrong name. Um, so that's kind of the, the verification process. And from there, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, this is the BitPay send screen. I just want to send a little bit of Bitcoin to Marty and shows me who it's sending to. It's showing me he is verified. Um, and then what's happening is when I slide to pay here, um, on the back end, they're like savant, dollar sign savant.com. They are running a pay ID server and they have Marty's addresses for Bitcoin tied to his name. So I am sending to an address on the back end, but it's showing like I'm just sending to Marty. That's kind of the beautiful thing and the cool thing about what pay ID can do. Um, so I'll go ahead and slide um, payment sent. Marty received the money. And from that point forward, 
he is a verified user and I can send any amount of money to him and can at least trust that he is in control um, of that wallet also of that name, that pay ID name. Um, so with that, that is pay ID um, within the BitPay app. You can go to iOS, Android um, and download our the BitPay app. Um, we've got a cool US debit card. It's non-custodial. You control the keys. Um, and we've got some real cool new features coming in here like pay ID. So uh, check it out and appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. It's great to hear from David, Stephen, and others on their take of uh, the events in the crypto industry. Um, our industry is definitely full of a um, very exciting future and very interesting times ahead. My name is Chris Choi and I am the product lead of Crypto.com Pay. Crypto.com just celebrated uh, our fourth year anniversary and we're currently having, uh, we currently have more than 3 million users and growing. Our mission is to accelerate the world's transition to cryptocurrency. Our services range from exchange, wallet, card and payments, and most recently, we have launched a bunch of DeFi features as well. PayID is something that we see that fits in very well with our mission. It makes payment between peer-to-peer -peer and even peer-to-merchant a lot easier. So without further ado, let me demonstrate how to register a PayID on our Crypto.com app. So. Just open your Crypto.com app, go to settings, and you'll be able to see Pay ID. Click register Pay ID. All of our Pay IDs within Crypto.com would end with dollar sign PayID.Crypto.com. So if you like our domain name of Crypto.com and you want a Pay ID ending with Crypto.com, this is the place where you want to register your Pay ID. So in this instance, I'm going to type in Chris and I'm going to register my pay ID. Done. As easy as that. So my pay ID is chris dollar sign payid.crow.com. So now I'm going to pass it on to my partner, Adam, and he's going to demonstrate how to send funds using pay ID from his platform to mine. Thanks, Chris. Hey everybody, it's Adam here from the BitTrue team and I am so excited to be here with you today showing you how you can register and use PayID to send and receive XRP on BitTrue. XRP has been the cornerstone of BitTrue ever since our exchange started over two years ago. We were the first exchange to adopt XRP as a base pair. We now have over 50 XRP trading pairs. We were the first to offer an XRP investment option with PowerPiggy and we're honored to now be among the first exchanges to let you transfer your XRP with PayID. If you've ever sent XRP to an exchange, you'll likely be familiar with the tag system. You need to include the correct tag associated with your account in order to make sure that your XRP arrives correctly. If you forget the tag or type it incorrectly, it can cause big problems as your, fu as your funds go missing for a few days. But PayID is going to fix this. In the future, you won't need a tag. All you'll need is your simple, memorable, speakable pay ID. And today, we're going to register and try out the address adam.payid.bittrue.com. To register your pay ID on Bittrue, just head to your deposit page, select XRP, and then select pay ID. Then enter in the name of the address that you wish to use and then click Generate New Address. To send your XRP, just head to the Withdrawal page on Bittrue, select XRP, Pay ID, and then enter in the Pay ID address that you wish to send to. Then select the amount and enter your PIN code, your email withdrawal code, and your Google 2FA code to continue. And that's it, your XRP will be sent. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for demonstrating how easy it is to register a pay ID and sending to a pay ID on your platform. So let me just check um, on my uh, on crypto.com wallet app again. 
just let me just uh, open up my beautiful crypto.com app and see yes so I can see as you can see right now 50 XRP just received from Adam so there we have it that's how easy pay ID is um, thanks for having us and hope you enjoy the next demo thank you Good morning. Thank you to the previous keynote speakers. It has been amazing to listen to all the progress has been done and will be done in the future with PayID. I am Sergio Mello. At heart, I want to bring technology to mainstream. FinTech, in my opinion, started in 1872, when Western Union connected the two ends of the United States with a telegraphic line, and immediately after started delivering money transfer services on the same line. Those services are still called telegraphic transfers. In my lifespan, I witnessed in 2003 the launch of the first 3G network in Italy. I was doing video calls at the time. And in 2007, I was living in Korea and I witnessed the launch of the first mobile money system that was based purely on smartphones with NFC contactless payments accepted throughout the whole country directly from a bank account or a self-contained wallet in the phone. And now I would like to bring everything one step forward. So I'm working with Tangem, where I'm the CEO, and we work very hard every day to provide universal access to digital assets. You may already know our cards. We produce this beautiful, fantastic, high security hardware wallets that are a self-contained key management system. I have the power of uh, hardware security module and the usability of a uh, metro card. This is a fundamental component in our solutions for payments and identity and authenticity. They're based on a secure platform, certified, EAL 6 plus, audited firmware, which is proprietary, audited by Kudelsky Security, can sign transactions with elliptic curve within less than a second. And as I said before, the most important thing is that the key life cycle is completely self-contained within the cards. So when we use a card, we have a key management that is physically available and portable, and we have an interface that loses all the importance, the relevance, and the need for security and trust. So we basically disintermediate trust and we draw a straight line that goes directly from a physical object, which is a card, to a blockchain asset. All of a sudden, you no longer need a phone or a, a computer to hold your assets. Asymmetric cryptography and blockchains have propelled the digital world to new heights. We sit pretty high now, but ultimately security is down to the weakest link. And uh, if the weakest link is intermediary and transport of information between a uh, sender of money and a receiver, then we do have a vulnerability. So we have solved how to uh, go to market with uh, a product that is from mainstream, but we still need to make sure that when I tell Chris my pay ID address, he can verify and make sure that no man in the middle, no trusted platform in the middle has manipulated that data in order to um, operate fraud. So what we're going to show today is a way to use the properties of asymmetric cryptography applied to a verification of a pay ID address. My Tangem wallet app is now able to generate an identity key. This identity key, the public part of the identity key, can be shared directly on a back channel and Wallet address stored in my PayID account, PayID profile, is signed with the identity key. Therefore, I can show you the flow. When I scan a card, I create my own PayID account. I'll create Sergio M. Dollar sign PayID .com. 
I create this pay ID. And I see that my phone has generated also an identity key. It's now not time to ask for an inbound transfer. Hey, Craig, how are you? I'm good. Fantastic. Okay, Would so you like, please, to send me 10 um, XRPs? You know, my PID address is sergiom $PID.tangem.com. Okay. And if you want to verify it, this is the print of my public identity key. Awesome. Would you share that with me via Signal? Absolutely. Let me do it right away. Okay. Did you receive it? I got it. Perfect. Thanks, Sergio. Hey, everybody. My name is Craig DeWitt, the founder of Payburner. Payburner is founded on the simple premise that you should be able to move your money uh, as easily as sending an email today. And so because of that, we built a number of products, um, including a browser plugin that allows you to send and receive and request XRP um, in a non-custodial fashion, meaning that you are the one who owns your funds and you and only you can control where you send it, how you receive it, and what you use it for. We also have a ecosystem built around Payburner of digital websites like X Songs and like crypto stickers and, and many others that allow you to use this plugin for one-click payments to buy and sell goods online. One-click checkout experience across the entire internet using the best asset for digital payments, XRP. One of the core pieces of what Payburner does is it gives you control over your value. And really what I'm excited to show with Sergio here is that with verifiable pay ID, now you're also in control of your identity as well. So you can really do a self-sovereign check of the identity of the actual wallet and pay ID without relying on Payburn or any centralized server. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send Sergio some money. So I'm gonna come up here into my browser plugin. I'm going to select make payment. I'm going to select pay ID. And I'll put in Sergio's pay ID. Okay. And what you see now is the verifiable thumbprint for his pay ID. Then I'll just do a visual check based on what I have in Signal that Sergio sent me. I'll just make sure that these line up. They line up. On a peer-to-peer -peer basis, we've just evaluated each other's um, pay ID. So now I can be sure that the person I'm sending funds to really is Sergio on the other side. And now I'll just put Sergio with 10 XRP and I'll press send. And there you have it. Instantaneous value transfer with a self-sovereign pay ID. Easy to send in an email. And let me check. Balance validation. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I just received your XRPs. This feature is live now. It's uh, available from uh, the Android and iOS app stores with the Tangem Tap app, which has just been relaunched with uh, new features and a new uh, user experience. We're very happy that uh, we are at the forefront of innovation on all sides of the story, and PID is absolutely marrying our philosophy of interoperability and uh, utmost security, where you push the trust to the edges. People should be able to manage their own identities, their own trust independently from the network. Thank you very much for listening today. Thank you. It's great to hear from the keynote speakers. The future of payments looks bright and inspiring. I'm Marcus, co-founder and CEO at Tova Labs, and we are making it easier to store, send, and receive crypto assets. For the past few months, we have been collaborating with Coinfield to develop a new app called PayMe Plus. With PayMe Plus, you can replace complex wallet addresses and account numbers with a simple universal payment ID. In our presentation, 
You will hear from Reza Basaj, one of our founding members. We will show you a demo of PayMe Plus, and we've also created a commercial. Now let's hear from Brent, who is going to tell us more about PayMe Plus. Hey, I'm Brent. And I'm Brent. Oh, hey, good to see you. Listen, I need your help. Well, what's the problem, Brent? Well, Brent, I love crypto, but sending and receiving payments can be so frustrating. I can instantly and easily send messages and email to people, yet sending crypto payments is just as hard as it was 10 years ago. Wallet addresses are too long and complicated to remember, and it's too easy to make a mistake. Well, Brent, I have some good news for you. Let me tell you about PayMe Plus. Every day, millions of people send payments globally. PayMe Plus makes receiving payments as easy as sending and receiving email. No way. Yes way, Brent. Imagine a world with no more confusing wallet addresses. Now you can send crypto using a simple, easy to remember address. How does PayMe Plus work, Brent? I'll show you. But first, let's hear from one of the founding team members of PayMe Plus. Thank you, Brent. And hi, everyone. Hope you're enjoying this event so far. As Brent mentioned, hundreds of millions of people around the world send and receive money every day. And yet, there's no universal address for payment networks. Thanks to PayID technology and the PayMe Plus app, this is not going to be the case in the future. PayMe Plus is an incredible app that uses the PayID technology to allow just about anyone to obtain and manage their pay IDs without relying on third-party service providers. Combining security and usability, we have designed the app to be an ultimate tool that takes care of all the user's receivable addresses, such as crypto addresses, PayPal, Venmo, IBAN, and so on. We're excited to be releasing the PayMe Plus app, so let's go back to Brent so we can all see a demo together. Thank you. Thank you, Reza. Now, let's take a look at PayMe Plus in action. After installing the PayMe Plus app from Google Play or the App Store, you'll be greeted with a short introduction. If you're a new user, you'll need to create an account while existing users can log in. To log in, enter your email and password and your two-factor authentication code. This is the main screen of PayMe Plus. In the top left is the menu. The content area shows your pay ID labels, added payment networks, and a button for sharing your pay ID. So far, I've added two payment networks, the Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchains. I'm going to add a third. To add a payment network, you have two options. Just type, paste, or scan a wallet address, or select a payment network from the list and enter your details. PayMe Plus also supports traditional payment networks, such as PayPal. When typing, pasting, or scanning a wallet address, PayMe Plus will auto-detect what network it belongs to. PayMe Plus has detected that this address belongs to the XRP ledger. At this point, select which pay ID this payment network should be added to. It could be your primary pay ID or a pay ID with a custom label that you've created. As a final optional step, you can select which currencies you prefer to receive in this payment network. You then see a summary of all details. The XRP ledger address has now been added to my pay ID with two preferred currencies, XRP and Solo. Now I can share my pay ID and get paid on the Bitcoin, Ethereum, or XRP network. To do this, I tap the share button. My friends can either scan the QR code on my phone or I can click the share pay ID button, which allows me to easily share my pay ID via a messaging app like Signal or Telegram. PayMe Plus is capable of managing multiple pay IDs, so I'm going to create another one. Type your desired pay ID name. It could be your nickname, real name, or anything else you'd like. You have the option to create a public profile for your pay ID. You can name this profile, give it a description, and upload a profile image. A public profile is useful when your friend is using a service or wallet without pay ID support. Simply send them your public profile link, where they can copy and paste your wallet addresses. Here you can swipe between your favorite pay IDs and add labels to them so you know which is which. It's a bit like having multiple bank accounts in one place. I'm going to label this pay ID savings. Now I have one pay ID without a label and one with the savings label I just created. Each pay ID can have different payment networks attached. In PayMe Plus, security and privacy come first. PayMe Plus will support verifiable pay IDs, 
where your device signs the payment details locally, making attackers unable to modify lookup requests. PayMe Plus will also allow you to verify your website or social media handles, giving your contacts stronger confidence that your pay ID belongs to you and not to an imposter. So what do you think, Brent? I think Christmas has come early. So how do I get PayMe Plus? All you have to do is go to www.payme.plus to find out more, and you can download the PayMe Plus app on the App Store and on Google Play. Oh, thanks, Brent. I can't wait to start using it. Pay Me Plus, so simple. Thanks for listening, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you, Riz and Brent, for that demonstration, and thank you, everyone, for watching our commercial. As Brent mentioned, you can download Pay Me Plus from App Store or Google Play. And Pay Me Plus is entirely free to use. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Hi, I'm Robert Swarthout. And today we're gonna to spend some time talking about payidvalidator.com. This past summer, I participated in the PayID hackathon Prior to the hackathon, I was working on building a PayID server that was based on AWS Lambda when I realized the server that I was building may not be responding correctly according to spec to all the different headers and response body types. I built the validator to help other developers try to find the issues that they may be accidentally building into their app when they're integrating PayID into an existing system and not using the PayID implementation server. The payidvalidator.com system will help you find any and all problems that you're having to, that would allow other applications to easily interface with your payid. The first address that we're going to use is an address for the XRP Tipbot um, wallet on BitHomp. We're going to choose XRP Mainnet. We're going to click Validate. Validator goes out. This particular server on BitHop received a 100% score on all passes. You can see the response headers as they came back. These are untouched and fully for you know, debugging purposes. You can see that a 200 response um, was returned by the, um, by the server. We also do a check to make sure that you're not exposing the admin APIs that are provided with the implementation server that the PID team um, has released on PID.org. In this case, it was not exposed. And we do some access control header checks for the different access control headers here and checking to make sure that, you know, in this case, that we only want to see get and options um, values in this particular allow methods header. Further down here, we're going to see that we're checking to make sure you're exposing certain PID headers. The, the cache control header is a no store, that is um, per spec, and the content type does say application JSON. We're starting to get into the meat of the response body here. The validator does a check for the wallet. In this case, it's just the, the generic um, default addresses object here. Multiple addresses can be returned. We do a lookup on this XRPL mainnet address and just to help the developer, we do look up and say, oh, you have this much XRP in your wallet. And the last header that is checked is the, um, make sure the response body is of the correct type, XRPL mainnet, that's the request that we sent. Let's do another check for um, a different wallet so we can show that some servers are actually not responding with everything correct. I'm gonna choose all here. This is also gonna show you that the, um, this server has multiple addresses um, set up for this pay ID. You can scroll down, you see they got a score of 92%, but what failed is they have post being included in their allowed headers. This is not um, current, this, this is not um, the correct um, value to be shown in the current spec. You can see down here, the payload, they do have an XRP mainnet, Bitcoin mainnet, and Ethereum mainnet. 
Another thing we are gonna demo here is um, with PayID version 1.3, there is a um, the ability to pass in um, or to return verified addresses. So cryptographically um, uh, signed um, pay ID addresses can be um, returned in the response body. So in this case, the addresses object is empty, but the verified addresses is provided. You can see that 100% pass here and these the signatures and um, are validated against the um, pay ID and everything is 100% correct here. An example of when it does not work is this here, and we can see the validator is gonna return a non. It's basically a little under 100% here because the signature does not ma match um, what was intended. And I purely just wrote bad signature at the beginning of it, but that you can kind of get the point. One other thing, part of the validator that was recently added is a pay ID generator. So think of flipping this around. You are building an app and you want to test to see if your um, application is processing pay IDs correctly. If you were to make a request to this pay ID dollar sign pay ID validator.com, you would get back a 100% validated um, response that actually has addresses for all these different payment networks down here. That's great, but you also may want to test use cases where you have a bad course header or there's a malformed, mal malformed JSON body. You check that, now you can use this pay ID-18 and it kind of provides you a bad response, whatever bad is intended to be for this use case. You can check all the boxes, you can check one, whichever you prefer, you copy it, you use it, it's pretty simple. I appreciate everybody spending time watching this. If you're interested in spending more time helping suggest ideas or if you find bugs, there's a link to the GitHub repo in the footer of the website located at payidvalidator.com. The validator is all open source and we love any contributions. Thanks and have a great day. Hi, my name is Tyler Storm. I'm a senior software engineer at Ripple. I build tools and products that help developers use the protocols and APIs that Ripple provides. Today, I'm going to be demoing one of those tools, the PayID Sandbox. For those of you who do not know, PayID is a universal payment identifier that allows you to have a single identifier for all your different payment rails, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, you know, potentially even Venmo or ACH, uh, you can have all of these combined into a single identifier, such as Tyler dollar sign payid.org. When talking about PayID to developers, they usually want to have a quick way to try PayID before they invest their time and resources into building or deploying PayID into their stack. The PayID Sandbox allows developers to do just that. I'm going to walk you through the PayID Sandbox and show you how easy it can be to use PayID. So in order to set up your PayID sandbox, you're going to have to go to payid.org and click the sign in button in the top right. We will be signing in with GitHub. Hopefully every developer here has a GitHub account they can sign in with. It will request you to authorize the, the PayID application for your uh, email address data. So we can then send you guys emails on updates around PayID. Here you'll specify your name, as well as your email and your company. The email is already filled out based off of the GitHub email. And then here's where you can define your virtual PayID server. So effectively, we're gonna be able to register PayIDs to whatever the virtual server domain that you select here. So for this, I'm gonna say PayID demo. So I'm gonna create a virtual server domain of PayID demo. And then as you can see here, now we own the, this virtual server domain of payiddemo.sandbox.payid.org. In addition to that, you will also receive an admin API token. The admin API token will allow you to call the private APIs on the virtual sandbox, such as create user, update user, and delete user. So let's jump into the GUI and see how we can create payids using the sandbox. 
So here we're going to create a pay ID and we're going to call this pay ID Tyler and we're going to select the XRPL payment network and then we're going to put this address in as our as our test address to assign to this pay ID. So if we look over here in the right, we're going to see what information we're going to be sending to the server. So this is a curl snippet that tells you exactly where the destination is that we're sending to, what the version is that we're sending it under. Here is where you can see that authorization bearer token that we talked about on the previous screen. And this authenticates your account to make these requests. Uh, the data raw here that you're seeing is the pay ID that you specified, which is Tyler pay ID demo sandbox pay ID org, as well as the addresses that you are sending to register to that pay ID. So I'm going to execute this code and we'll receive a response back from the server. This is saying that we successfully registered the pay ID and we registered it to this XRPL address. Now, if you look under the JavaScript snippet, you can see the Axios code. Uh, if you were to write this code in JavaScript, you would use this format to do the exact same thing that we just did in curl. Now, if we want to call this uh, pay ID and get the information from it, it's exactly the same as calling any public pay ID. Uh, and we are gonna go over here and we're gonna specify Tyler and we're going to say the XRPL network for testnet. And if we execute this code, we get back Tyler's pay ID demo at sandboxpayid.org. And you can see here the exact address that we specified. There's also the ability here to replace and delete users as well. Um, but, in, you're, but you're going to have to try that one on your own. If you'd like to set up your own pay ID sandbox, please visit payid.org and click the sign in button in the top right corner. If you'd like to integrate PayID into your stack, please check out our documentation at docs.payid.org. If you'd like to join the community and discuss PayID with us, please check out our Discord server, which can be found at chat.payid.org. Thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the event. My name is Ian and I'm a member of the Ripple engineering team. Today, we're going to talk about how to set up a PayID Lambda based server from a CloudFormation stack. The problem we're looking to solve is trying to run a PayID server with the lowest investment possible in terms of time and money while still having a reliable server available for users to access. We know that setting up DNS and SSL certificates can be difficult for a lot of people and this process should eliminate most of the headaches involved in doing so. We're gonna be working from the GitHub project Spring Eng, so X-P-R-I-N-G dash E-N-G, slash pay ID Lambda. And to go through the steps, you're gonna need a few things. You're gonna need an AWS account, a domain you wanna use for your pay IDs, a certificate imported into Amazon Certificate Manager, specifically in US East 1 for compatibility reasons. And after you finish launching the stack, you're going to have to update the domain that you use to reference the name servers that are listed in the Route 53 hosted zone that the CloudFormation stack will set up for you. To start off, since this may be the most unfamiliar part for most people, we're gonna talk about just how you get a certificate for your domain into the Amazon Certificate Manager. Right now, we're in the Amazon Certificate Manager in US East 1. And what we're gonna do is we're going to click Request a Certificate and we're gonna select Public, which is a free certificate that Amazon will issue you. If you've already generated one, you can import it as well. But in our case, we haven't, so we're gonna have Amazon generate one for us. We have a domain registered already through the provisioner Freenom, which is a free domain provider, and we're going to paste it in here and click next. We're gonna choose DNS validation. We're not gonna add any tags, go to review, and then on step five, the console is gonna tell me that it's pending validation. In order to get this validation step to pass, we're going to have to paste these two values into our registrar's DNS settings. Now that we have these pasted in here, we're going to save the changes and we have to wait for the registrar to update this record and we have to wait for Amazon to pull it for us. 
This can take a while. Sometimes it takes 30 minutes. Sometimes it could take longer. Luckily, we don't have to wait right now because we already have a domain available that has a certificate issued that we're going to use instead. The domain is lambda paid demo video.ml and we'll be moving forward with the demo using that. Now it's worth pointing out, this is going to take care of 90% of what you would normally need to deal with when it comes to generating an SSL certificate and messing around with DNS settings. There's one more step that we'll have to take at the end, but it's a very easy one. Now, to prove this wasn't already up and running, we're gonna try and hit the URL that the test account would appear on and show that it's unreachable. We can also see that the PayID validator says the same thing. Both of these has failed, which means we're not up and running already, so we're not cheating the process by having something that was working. We'll be using this domain when we go to launch our stack. We click launch stack and we're already using the template that we need via the button that was available on the GitHub project. Click next, then enter your domain name. Click next again, next again, and then we can create the stack. This takes a few minutes to run through all of its steps and you can click the refresh button to see it moving along. This is going to create a variety of serverless resources, including a few Lambda functions, two of which are used during the creation of the stack to derive values for us, and the other being the PayID server itself. It's also going to create an S3 bucket, some API gateway endpoints, and a hosted zone, so we can use our certificate and domain with the API gateway endpoints we end up creating. This usually takes somewhere between two and five minutes to completely execute. And after it's done, we're going to have the values that we need for the name servers that our domain registrar needs to know about. Now, through the magic of video editing, we can see that the CloudFormation stack has completed. If we go back and look at the timestamps from start to finish, it took around three and a half minutes to complete. Now that this is complete, we can go to the output and see the name servers that we need to enter into our registrar. All we have to do is copy and paste these four values into the form on our registrar site and save. This change doesn't necessarily take effect instantly. Once again, we're dealing with DNS, so it's depending on DNS propagation, which can be quite slow. Your domain might not show up instantly as a result of this. In order to test it, we're going to go to our domain followed by slash test account, which has our default account that which, which was created by the stack. The URL loaded correctly, which means we're live. If we go to the PayID validator and check the domain again, now we can see that we're passing. The reason for this not being 100% was due to an issue with PayID validator not validating testnet accounts correctly, which is what we're using in the case of the test account that's set up with the stack. When it comes to the test account, the PayID Lambda is using an S3 bucket to serve up PayID entities. This bucket will have the name that you used when you created your stack, followed by the term S3 bucket, and then a unique identifier at the end. In here, you can see the test account.json file, which matches the name that we put at the end of the URL. If you want to add additional PayIDs, you just create more JSON files, and whatever the name of that file is will be able to be appended to the end of your domain to serve up that pay ID. And with that, we're live with a pay ID server. We went from domain to certificate to being hosted in the cloud with serverless resources within a few minutes time. If this was interesting to you or you're just interested in pay ID in general, I'd like to take the time to encourage you to go to payid.org and sign up for the newsletter. And if you want to play around with the PayID Lambda, go to github.com slash springeng, X-P-R-I-N-G dash E-N-G slash PayID Lambda. Thanks for your time and thanks for attending.
everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Jen Yu, and I lead a team at Ripple focused on developer products and initiatives. I hope you enjoyed watching those product demos as much as I did. Uh, PayID has been such an incredibly fun, rewarding, and very collaborative effort uh, led by a bunch of members of the Open Payments Coalition. Uh, this is the group that's been working on the protocol itself, but also supporting PayID as the addressing protocol for sending and receiving money across a variety of applications around the world. Uh, today, the coalition has a user reach of over 125 million uh, by companies who support PayID. Uh, it includes seven of the top 10 exchanges, uh, several wallets, and of course, a large group of developers who are not only working on the protocol itself, but also coming up with innovative use cases to apply PayID, uh, like the ones that you also just saw. As you all know, PayID is completely open, built on open standards and protocols. It's secure uh, with verifiable ID uh, for wallets. Um, and it's also incredibly easy uh, and simple to integrate. Uh, we just rolled out a bunch of developer tools to make it even easier and faster. Um, you can check out uh, our PayID uh, dev sandbox as well as our AWS Lambda integration. Um, go to payid.org uh, for more details. And if you're interested in seeing PayID in action, you can see it in a variety of places, including on BitPay, BitTrue, Crypto.com, and Coin Payments, where you can set up your own unique PayID. And if you're interested in joining the Open Payments Coalition, or just want to get in our, involved in our mission for how to make payments more uh, open, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to invite you to some of our events in the future and collaborate with you. Also, a big thank you to our keynote speakers today, uh, David, Stephen, and Joey. Uh, as you heard from them, and as many of you already know, uh, the world of crypto and the many players in the ecosystem and the applications across payments and finances is constantly changing and evolving. And at RippleX, which is the developer platform at Ripple, uh, we, we believe that the future of payments becoming more open is really predicated on the success of developers who are working on open protocols and making the entire ecosystem a lot more open than it is today. So to that end, RippleX is rolling out a variety of developer-facing programs. Uh, if you are an application developer, an infra engineer, a market infra developer, or just a developer who's starting to learn about the many use cases for crypto, uh, we hope you'll join us. You'll see the link on the screen here. Um, we have a bunch of grants that are coming up as well as uh, developer programs, uh, educational content series, if you're just new to crypto. Our mission really is to support all of the developers and entrepreneurs out there by removing all the friction that comes with integrating blockchain technologies and making it possible for you and your users to send and receive payments across any currency network and geography. At RippleX, we believe that the future of money is open, it's interoperable, and it's reliable for a much better user experience and access to everyone around the world. And we hope you'll join the community collaborating to make that a reality. With that, thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope to see you at our next event. Jen and to all of our speakers this morning. We really hope you enjoyed the program so far. It's been jam-packed, very interesting morning, and we really appreciate all the demos and presentations that you've given. We're gonna take a break and then pick up the programming again this afternoon at 2.59 Pacific Standard Time. We'll have more for you in line of today's crypto focus with some exciting panels, presentations, and discussions, starting with a fireside chat with Berkeley's Rich Lions on stablecoins. We hope to see you this afternoon. Take care.